the shining star of today's function, Dr. Subhi Jacob George from JNCSR Bangalore, Dean of Science, Dr. Jinu George, faculty members who are presenting Nobel Prize winning topics uh, today, other faculty members, guests from other institutes, dear students. This is a golden day in the history of our college that we are honoring one of the pioneer scientists in India, the recent Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Award winner, Dr. Subhi Jacob George. He needs no formal introduction amidst the scientific community today. It is a personal privilege for me Hello. as he is my MSc classmate and my close friend. For me, it's not a surprise that he received the most coveted prize for science in India. I remember my classmate who sat beside me years back, the spark inside him, his determination. The most commendable thing about Dr. Subhi Jacob George is that he did his schooling from a Malayala medium school in rural area of Ernakulam. From there, uh, he went on for higher studies in St. Albert's College, Ernakulam, thereafter Maharaj's College, and then uh, we both were uh, uh, in the same class uh, in School of Chemical Sciences, MG University, Kota. Uh, he will talk about his um, uh, research work, what is going on, what is uh, his contributions, definitely. I would like to mention one uh, of his recent uh, papers uh, came in Nature Communications. There, uh, they have introduced a revolutionary idea, redox response to supramolecular fibers. Besides science, chemistry, biology, uh, cricket is a passion for Subi. I still remember uh, he is a genuine fast bowler, furious fast bowler. I found it extremely difficult to stop his deliveries uh, years back when we were playing for our department team. He's still continuing that unstoppable rhythm in science too. I wish him all the very best, all the best. And um, so, so um, it is my privilege uh, as a formal um, uh, way of in, uh, welcoming him. I welcome uh, Dr. Subhi Jacob George uh, to Sacred Heart College Devara and uh, uh, for Heart in Science Congress. Next, I would like to welcome our dynamic honorable principal, Father Dr. Prashant Parikapalli CMI. Officially, this may be his last year. He is uh, genuinely interested and eager to conduct many such type of programs uh, uh, for the research community here and for uh, all the departments. I welcome Father Dr. Prashant Parakapal in CMI, Father Dr. Josh John Thorvagel CMI, Vice Principal of the College is also here. Welcome Father. The Senior Most Faculty, Dr. C.B. Matthew, welcome to this function. Faculty of Dean of Science, Dr. Jinu George. Guests from other institutes, my fellow faculty members, and also faculty members who are presenting uh, the Nobel Prize winning themes today. Welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Franklin John. Uh, the greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He's the one that gets the people to do the greatest things. And here we have with us our principal, Dr. Prashant Palikyapalil. Uh, Father, the greatest inspiration to the whole Hartian community. I request him to give away the introductory remarks. So, uh, I think Father... I think has not joined. Uh, Josh, Father Josh, shall we proceed with other... I use programs and uh, we'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, that will be fine. Okay. Now I invite Reverend Father Dr. Jos Jones, Vice Principal and Controller of Excavations. 
for felicitation for speech. Felicitation speech. A warm good afternoon to one and all who are gathered here. I can see the spark in the eyes of all here, uh, not only because uh, uh, Dr. Professor Subi is with us, but we all love science and we all uh, do research in a serious manner. And again, it's a very, very great honor and privilege for all of us to have uh, Dr. Professor to be with us, to inspire us more. And I consider it as a great honor to join this intimate gathering of the scientific community of Sekhar College, Thayavara, on the occasion of a Science Congress, Hattin Science Congress, to honor Professor Subhi George, the leading luminary of Indian science from Kerala, and as uh, Dr. Franklin correctly said, from a remote village. And uh, a profound Patnagar of uh, 2020. An eminent scholar as, and a well-known scientist, Professor Zubi George epitomizes the triumph of will over constraints, of genius over circumstances. All through his Esther days, he has pursued and achieved excellence in both academics as well as research. His achievements are powerful and lasting in their impact on global science, stressing the interdisciplinarity in research, which is the need of the time. And what makes them so inspiring to younger generations in our country is that he has made them possible in an, our country like India, that was synonymous with the constraints of resources, constraints of infrastructure, constraints of opportunity, and of course, remuneration. So definitely, Professor Subi has demonstrated that world-class research can be accomplished on Indian soil, as uh, our Prime Minister always says, make in India, despite all these constraints. And his research brings its own reward and benefit to the society in near future also, no doubt. The present award is also a recognition of the nation to the unsung heroism of Indian science. So I take this opportunity to congratulate Professor Subhi and wish many more years of productive pursuit on his passion for science and research. Thank you, sir, for being with us and all the best. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now I invite now I invite you. To Senior Most Faculty and Head of the Department of Physics for Felicitation Speech. Thank you. Greetings and peace from Sacred Hearts. Respected Principal Rev. Dr. Prasant Palagapali, Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Subhi Jacob George, Shanti Suru Patnagar Award Winner Chemistry 2020, Vice Principal Rev. Dr. Jos. Dean of Research, Dr. Franklin, Dean of Science, Dr. Jinu, my dear guests, teachers, and students. At the onset, I would like to congratulate Dr. Subhi Jacob George for being awarded with the prestigious Sandhi Sudhu Padnagar Award. We all know that materials are made up of self assembly of molecules our atoms. With the new technology, we, were able to, we are able to manipulate atoms at nano levels, maybe from 100 to 1000 atoms. At this nano regime, you know that physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, all the uh, science will converge. And it is actually the technology of nature, this manipulation at the nano level. The great physicist Richard Feynman predicted this in 1959 itself. While he was delivering his talk, the annual, uh, there is plenty of room at the bottom in the annual American Physical Society meeting. 
so we can mimic or design molecules as we wish these molecules self assembled to form various life forms and materials so dr subhi jacob jor his research work is about the self assembly of supra molecular polymers now i am very happy that our science team dinomis was visiting him for 3 months under his guidance one of the top research institutions he was working is jnc asr you are all familiar with he has got many publications in rated journals like nature he is also winner of two prestigious awards swarna jain fellowship shanti saru patnagar award which is given to researchers below the age of 45 years we are proud to have you in our midst once again i congratulate you for winning this prestigious award i wish that you may be able to unravel many secrets of nature and able to come up with new bioengineering techniques that will help mankind and to find answers to many fundamental questions of life to develop uh, technology for sus uh, sustainable nature friendly living and to save the planet and i also like to congratulate the organizers from principal and specially our science dean dr gino thank you all thank you sir i assume uh, our principal principal has joined the meeting i invite father for uh, giving the introductory remarks father prashant he seems he is not here and uh, now we have the results of bj dominic endowment msc project competition presentation competition so i request dr subhi jacob george today's reputed girls to declare the winners we would like to see all the winners so winners please switch on the video as your names are announced so uh, good afternoon everyone uh, so it's a great pleasure to announce this uh, awards for this msc uh, dr vj dominic msc project awards uh, because i think uh, it's very nice to see that such awards are there to encourage students uh, because um, from my experience i tell you uh, this is a more first opportunity for most of us to uh, get a hands on experience on research and probably this is a time we make our mind that whether research is my field it's our field or something else so i think that way it's very important uh, to uh, encourage students and i, I i'm really glad that uh, these awards are uh, instituted at sh tevera so uh, i i am informed that uh, there were uh, 12 projects were there uh, for considerations for this award and uh, out of that six of them uh, made it to the final and uh, so i congratulate all of you all the tol students uh, who did wonderful project work because i'm sure uh, anything you would like to say uh, i cannot hear you you are muted uh, chinu okay uh, so uh, let me uh, come to the uh, announcement of the projects uh, the uh, first name is miss alekha kv from department of physics the first prize and uh, the second prize is uh, sruti krishna from zoology department and uh, the final the consolation prize goes to miss jayalakshmi k karta jayalakshmi r karta from department of mathematics so once again congratulations to all the winners not only to the winners all the uh, students who participated in the embassy projects because uh, i i have a suggestion that take it very seriously because this is the only opportunity probably for you to find out whether research is your cup of tea or not so uh, thank you thank you very much and uh, all the best thank you subhi sir now we have the long awaited talk by dr subhi jacob george 
the 2020 Shanti Swarup Bhatnaga Award winner in Chemical Sciences. Dr. Subhi George, Associate Chair and Professor at Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore, belongs to Arakuno Niravam. After completing his MSc Chemistry from Mahatma Gandhi University's School of Chemical Sciences with first rank, in 2004, he joined the group of Professor A. Ajaya Ghosh at National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, Trivandrum, for PhD. During 2005 to 2008, he has been a postdoctoral fellow at Laboratory at Macromolecular and Organic Chemistry, Eindhoven University of Technology, Netherlands. He is the recipient of various prestigious awards, such as Swarna Jayanti Fellowship from DST in 2017, Asian Photochemistry Association Young Scientist Award in 2015, NASI Scopus Young Scientist Award in 2015. Dr. Subhi Jacob George is the recipient of the 2020 Shanti Swarup Bhatnaga Award in Chemical Sciences, the most coveted award in multidisciplinary science in India. He has publications in various internationally reputed journals, including Nature and Givandeshami, Journal of American Chemical Society, etc. He is one of the top class scientists in the world with an H index of 52 and a total citation above 8000. His current interests focus on functional supramolecular polymers, living and non equilibrium supramolecular polymerization, supramolecular chirality, and organic optoelectronic materials. I welcome Dr. Subhi Jacob George for delivering his talk on Life Beyond Molecules, a dynamic world of supramolecular polymers. Yeah, so thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, respected fathers, teachers, my friends and students. Uh, at the outside, let me thank for the wonderful words, blessings and uh, wishes. I mean, like it's a wonderful feeling to be there at uh, Sacred Heart College because uh, many of my friends are the faculty in chemistry department. So that gives uh, a great pleasure to be uh, giving this uh, lecture and to attend this Heart and Science Congress. So at the outside, let me thank uh, all the organizing committee for uh, inviting me and uh, uh, asking me to deliver this lecture. Uh, so also, I also take this opportunity to congratulate all the teachers and mentors of uh, Sacred Heart College because I know that over the years, consistently you are doing a, a high quality education. Because I'm mean, like, I should mention this because uh, three times probably I have come to uh, Sacred Heart College, and you can imagine these three times are to submit the application form for pre degree, uh, degree, and masters. And uh, I know that the out of the many colleges available to me at Ernavalam, probably this is the best uh, college. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, I did not get admissions in pre-degree and uh, uh, also for uh, BSc at uh, Tevera. So it was uh, so that's why I uh, pursued uh, at Maharaja's for my BSc chemistry. But I did get admissions for the master's uh, MSc chemistry. But then uh, I had decided to probably go to St. Thomas Pala because I just looked back. I know that Tevera and uh, Pala were the options for me because all the master's ranks are coming from those two colleges. So, but uh, I decided to go to Pala and then, you know, that as Franklin uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I discontinued master's from there and subsequently joined uh, School of Chemical Sciences uh, uh, along with Franklin and so on. So, uh, so once again, congratulations. And so it's really honored and humble to be here attending this Heart and Science Congress and uh, happy to receive all blessings from uh, fathers. And uh, so I, as I mentioned, uh, once again, very happy to be, uh, I mean, like uh, to be at Stevra because of my wonderful friends, Franklin, uh, Jinu, and also uh, now recently Deepak has joined there. So they are, they are all, I'm like, I've been, uh, and also Dog, Dr. Grace, I'm like, I'm seeing her for, uh, seeing her after a long time. So I know many of them. So it's nice to speak in front of all of you. Uh, so what I, without, since my time is restricted, so I will not, uh, uh, I will directly enter into my talk. Uh, so what I will do considering the uh, kind of diverse audience, what I will do is probably introduce the, the topic of supramolecular polymers to all of you. It's one of the probably a field which is active for last two decades and uh, probably the two decades of uh, research in this field has given a lot of hope, a uh, lot of possibilities and a lot of opportunities. 
So that's something which uh, I would like to give a flavor of that to uh, students uh, to uh, get you motivated with this research field uh, and uh, probably to give a flavor. What are the challenges? I mean, it's as I mentioned, it's a kind of relatively young field. A lot of challenges are there. Uh, so it's a slowly progress. You know that I mean, even if you take organic chemistry, it probably took uh, two centuries I and mean, like even after two centuries, probably still we are learning new reactions in organic chemistry. So considering that this is two decades of research is nothing. Uh, so still a lot of possibilities, opportunities, challenges are there. So my job is to uh, give you uh, a kind of flavor uh, what I'm doing and why we are doing and where we are going. Uh, so I hope my sound is very clear to all of you. If you have any uh, trouble in hearing me or with the slides, please uh, alert me so I, I can rectify it. So the title, as I mentioned, is a dynamic world of supramolecular polymers. And uh, so I should mention that this is uh, this particular field is, uh, is supramolecular chemistry in general. I'm sure you are studying supramolecular chemistry at some point of time, at least in master's syllabus. So supramolecular chemistry field or the field I'm going to talk about today is something which is highly inspired by nature or our biological world or even our cells. Okay. So and uh, uh, so we are. The, or probably we can say that at this point, probably the attempt is not to mimic the uh, cell or attempt is not to make a kind of synthetic cell. We know that it is an extremely difficult job, uh, but probably to take inspiration from these cells uh, or the functioning of a cell uh, to probably to create artificial material with interesting functions okay, or lifelike materials. So let it, I will come uh, to that much more detail. And this is a wonderful video uh, you can see from Inner Life of a Cell uh, YouTube, how what uh, scientists have made it, just to tell you how complex is inside our cell. And probably this is a reason, uh, probably it's very difficult to define a life or very difficult to synthesize an artificial life. Uh, uh, we know that, uh, uh, one thing is very important is heli it's a highly dynamic world, as I mentioned in the title. The cell is a highly dynamic world. Lot of uh, so lot motion, everything is happening inside these cells, and uh, always continuous actions, assembly, disassembly process are going on. So, uh, and uh, as I mentioned that probably it's not able to probably we can make a synthetic cell because if we look into the complexity, heli it's highly complex entity it has multiple compartment it has multiple components uh, which are continuously performing function and in terms of complexity if you plot a graph it doesn't matter size uh, even if you look into the galaxies uh, it is considered cell is the most complex object so it involves atoms molecules assembly organization and also a lot of functions are performed by cell so with this itself we can imagine that it's impossible for us I mean, at this point, probably to create a cell with all these subcomponents inside that, right? So, uh, but as I mentioned, let's not attempt to make a cell, but let let us at least try to learn from cell. Uh, to just uh, because this is a probably small, smallest unit of a life, and probably this is the ideal scenario, ideal model system for us to learn things from it. Okay, and if you look into these aspects, which probably inspires chemists like us or people like working in supramolecular chemistry, two aspects. One is, if you look into most of the functions, uh, let me take, there are ex exceptions, but if you look into majority of the critical functions of the cell, it is never performed by a single molecule. On the other hand, it will be an assembly of organized uh, assembly of molecules, as mentioned by the father. It's not, uh, it's not like, a, it's not a kind of a single cell. It's a, it's a, it's a, we need a kind of, an ensemble of molecules to perform the function. So if you look into the cell membranes, which is, you know, that is a kind of assembly of lipid molecules or uh, actin uh, motor proteins, it's again a kind of assembly of proteins. Even DNA is probably just a two strands, but still you can see that it's not a single molecule. It's a kind of two strands uh, held together by weak interactions. So this is one aspect. So uh, the first inspiration is obviously for the starting of supramolecular chemistry would be it's an assembly of systems, not a kind of individual molecule is not performing the function. And the second aspect which people recently, which including the chemists like me, are more interested is a kind of from a material perspective is dynamics. So this is a kind of microtubule self-assembly. You can see that uh, it continuously assemble and disassemble. And that is very important for the many of the cells, motility, cell action, cell division, signal transduction. If you look into all these aspects, this microtubule assembly disassembly process is important. So these are the two aspects. We try to get inspired from nature and probably it's better to apply in synthetic materials and get a uh, lot of uh, inspiration uh, to make uh, new materials. 
as i mentioned uh, for an organic synthetic chemist i am a kind of organic synthetic chemist it's no longer a challenge to make a organic molecule right we know that waller synthesized urea in 1828 but probably 200 years later it think about anything including the antiviral drug we are uh, well known now even president has trump has the difficulty to pronounce his name but i'm saying that any molecule if you i'm confident probably organic chemists are confident probably you give enough time enough working hands and enough uh, money Uh, probably you can make any of the system so this is probably a confidence which gained 200 years of research in this particular field but if you look into other supramolecular chemistry as i mentioned uh, the jean mary lane who is the father of supramolecular chemistry coined the name it's a chemistry beyond the molecule and this is this is also a field which highly inspired from nature uh, and you know the uh, i'm sure all of you know in 1987 these three people got nobel prize for their attempt to go beyond the molecule okay and first uh, examples were like a crown either metal complexes hoskes chemistry nowadays it called more like a hoskes chemistry they were trying to synthesize receptor molecule which can bind kes molecules and again if you look into it lot of, it's lot of inspiration from nature right in nature there are lot of protein substrate complexes and principles they have adopted is the principles of molecular recognition in biology and try to extend into synthetic system right uh, and also if you uh, look into there are a lot of ion transport proteins uh, ion transport proteins in our cell membranes and so on so these were the motivation for this chemists to come up with uh, to think about chemistry beyond the molecule that is supramolecular chemistry and uh, people have used very weak interactions which is called non covalent interactions like hydrogen bonding pi pi stacking van der waals interactions L- electrostatic interactions they were used very this very weak interactions to create this kind of molecular receptors or hoskes complexes uh, probably we think that it is such a simple contribution that it gave it to nobel prize in 1987 if you do in this year probably we may not get such for a uh, such a simple contributions but i should mention that this is a first time probably chemists started thinking beyond a molecule right uh, we are learning slowly learning to uh, go beyond the molecules and i think in that aspects the nobel prize was given to the chemist creativity uh, to go one step further from uh, the single molecule to the assembly of molecules so that was about the assembly of molecules and i am sure all of you heard about this 2016 nobel prize about molecular machine i would consider that is probably the first attempt to address the dynamic aspects of cell right if you look into it this molecular machines were sorry so the molecular machines were an attempt to address the dynamics and or mimic the dynamics from the cell right so you know that in cells if you look into it there are proteins like actin myosin and uh, there are bacteria flagellum that rotatory motion translation motions lot of motors are there which performs function and this is probably uh, these people sovage stoddart and benferinga yeah. it's also can be considered as a branch of supramolecular chemistry because they dealt with molecules like catenanes and rotaxanes which is again not a single molecule it is uh, more than one molecule so, so the, in that aspect probably this is also can be considered as a branch of uh, supramolecular chemistry and giving lot of that tells that supramolecular chemistry has lot of opportunities and uh, uh, i know that i'm mean, like this is another nobel prize which is highly criticized by people because we cannot find something in which directly influence society okay right this is a wonderful chemistry this is probably the first time demonstration because this is a, a piece of ben ferringas work where he has used multiple fuels you know that how to power this molecular machines we need fuels either chemical fuels light fuel or electrochemical fuel and this is probably a series of uh, uh, this is a first time probably a microscopic motion performed by the molecule is visualized this is a gold nano rod uh, put on a sur- on a surface where, which is functionalized with lot of this molecular machines and you can see that once you shine light in this case is a photo fuel it start rotating probably this is a first observation of can uh, to say that molecular machines can indeed perform work and also you know that after uh, this uh, nobel prize was criticized I- i'm sure the students are aware of it you can go otherwise you can go to the youtube and say that molecular race first nano molecular race was organized six teams participated and uh, uh, they, so this, this that was based on elect, elect, electrical stimuli okay so it's possible so the, i i just wanted to show this example because we are slowly going from machines uh, sorry slowly going from assembly to motion and uh, again i just think uh, bring your attention to this particular example where uh, so again to perform a function 
Feringa has, Ben Feringa has to use not single molecule. This, there was a surface with large number of molecules are organized like a single uh, SAM. Sulfur symbol monolayer was formed on the surface and that collective motion of the large number of molecules performed a useful work. Again, you can imagine that motion is directly related to the organization of the molecules. This just two examples I showed uh, how to convince you that how can you start getting inspired from nature and trying to uh, mimic in uh, kind of synthetic materials. Uh, let's move on. So uh, this is just a starting point. But if you look into the nature, I will uh, try to recall your attention to the first video I have shown. Uh, you can see that if you look into the microtubule, the motion is not at a molecular level, right? Probably it's a kind of higher length scale. You see that large number of protein molecules are arranged probably like a, in uh, at least in a kind of 600, 500 nanometer length scale where thousands of protein molecules are there. And uh, it is at that level, it's a kind of higher length scale that assembly and disassembly process is controlling the most, most of the functions of the cell. Not really at the, I mean, there are examples at the molecular level also, but I'm saying that this is probably in terms of cell motion, cell motility, cell division, everything, if you look into it, this is probably the dynamics assembly and dynamics at the higher length scale, right? In this context, the question is, can we create such big micromolecules by self-assembly of molecular self-assembly, like a bottom-up approach, as Sir mentioned, bottom-up approach of small molecules, can we create large assemblies? And can we induce dynamics into the systems? Then probably we can think about that. We can think more like a more like lifelike materials and probably interesting functions can be thought about it. So as you can see, I'm trying to give a kind of general flavor to you to uh, think in these terms rather than going into the details of each subject. Uh, so this year, uh, I'm going to the next slide is obviously coming to my uh, topic of research. But before that, I should mention that this 2020, I, I'm sure all of you are aware, this is 100 years of micromolecular chemistry. And this was Hermann Stodinger in like, a, this is a classical paper he published in uh, 1920 uh, about the uh, polymers. Because you know that the polymers are used, unlike organic chemistry, polymer chemistry, polymers were used from long time, like a, starting from the Columbus time onwards, people were using natural rubber for many applications. But no one knew what is the structure of a polymer. Everyone thought that polymer is probably a kind of colloidal structure, but it was contrary to that prevailing ideas at that time. It was in 1920, uh, this Hermann Schrodinger proposed polymers are indeed large micromolecules and they are formed by, just like the gem clips like this, connected by the covalent bonds of small molecules which is called as repeating units or monomers. And that is the uh, history of polymers. And uh, this year is incidentally the 100 years of polymer chemistry. And it's quite appropriate that we are going to talk about another class of polymers uh, at this point. And also, at this, uh, although uh, Nobel Prize is only going to Hermann Stodinger, we all know that Wallace Carothers, his student, is the person who started synthesizing these molecules in the, inside the lab polymers inside the laboratory, starting from all of, you know, nylon 6, nylon 6, 6, all made by her, uh, wireless carothers. And unfortunately, he did not get Nobel Prize. And as you can see that he lived only up to the age of 40. He su committed suicide at the age of 40. And otherwise, definitely his name would have also appeared in this uh, micromolecular science, first my polymer chemistry Nobel Prize given in 1953. Uh, so let's move on. Let's come to the uh, today's uh, my molecules and or the kind of molecules which we are going to talk about. It's about supramolecular polymers. Uh, so you can see that this is again a kind of animation to give you a picture of how these molecules, uh, poly polymers are formed. So you can see that this is a simple molecule, uh, kind of benzene tricarboxamide molecules. You can see that it has three hydrogen bonds. So it's a tricarboxamide. So three amide bonds are at the periphery. And you can imagine that if you put it into a kind of solvent, these molecules can come on top of each other because of this directional hydrogen bonding and form long chains like this, right? These long chains are very similar to the classical polymers in terms of macromolecular or long chain. But the only difference is, as I mentioned, this is formed by the very weak non-covalent interactions. And you know that non-covalent interactions are weak. As a result, what happens is from the chain and from the surrounding, these monomers can come in and go out. Okay, we can call it that there is a kind of exchange dynamics of the monomers or the building blocks happens from the polymer chain and outside. Okay, uh, so. Uh, So should I answer this? There is a hand was right. Uh, right. I mean, like, should I answer now or should I go and address the questions at the end? Uh, better at the end, sir. 
yeah okay thank you uh, so uh, when we go so the, you can see that monomer exchange dynamics exits uh, so uh, as a result the so time scale at which this monomer goes out and uh, goes in and out of this polymer chain depends on the kind of monomer you take sometimes it can be millisecond sometimes it can be microseconds and sometimes it can be uh, hours which can be tuned to a certain extent by the molecular design but advantage is that what is advantage of such a monomer exchange you can imagine that it gives reversible properties responsive properties adaptive properties what i mean is so if you have continuous this monomer exchange and monomer exchange is big, mainly because it's not a strong bond it's because of the non covalent bond the energy barriers to break uh, the bonds are not so high so they like to go out and so they can respond to the changes in the environment and so on so one of the one, important thing you can imagine one example i'm saying just saying that i'm sure all of you are familiar with this movie uh, it would be nice to see kind of self healing material because uh, since the monomers are dynamic what happens is they can if there is a it's, it's again similar to the nature where there is a self repairing mechanism available if there is a damage in your system or a damage in your material the dynamics of the monomers ensure that it is addressed and it goes back to the originally thermodynamically equilibrated material so that's one of the biggest advantages one can imagine from this kind of uh, material so what we can make is kind of stimuli responsive material adaptive materials reversible materials so the dynamics brings not only the assembly of molecules combined with the dynamics of the system brings lot of opportunities for us so that was the message i wanted to give with these molecules and uh, uh, so one one of the success story i would show you this is a uh, this is one of the supramolecular polymer function i mean like made with a special hydrogen bonding which has a very high association constant even i association constant more than the even nature's uh, dna base pairs it has an association constant around 10 to the power 7 you can see that this this is already commercialized product you can see that if you cut the uh, cut the material into two and put it back allow it some time to self heal it re i mean it almost goes back to the original material with and it can hold almost same weight as the original material so you can see that what all the dynamics can bring wonders it can self heal materials similarly reversibility and reversibility and adaptive properties can be uh, uh, incorporated into this material so uh, what uh, so i'm slowly going into uh, what are the challenges we were trying to address uh, this is wonderful i'm like a supramolecular chemistry polymers are uh, probably first 10 years of research people find out that this is very similar to the classical polymers in terms of its viscous elastic properties and so on but one of the challenges was uh, unlike the polymer chemistry you know that in polymer chemistry we can make uh, covalent polymers we can make with a particular molecular weight or particular dispersity there are synthetic methods available this is one of the biggest challenge uh, very recently many of us faced is there is no structural control on this uh, material uh, so uh, the uh, the challenge i'm trying to uh, kind of explain in a very uh, very simple manner uh, just look into this energy landscape okay this is the energy landscape of supramolecular polymerization don't get confused so there are uh, you can when you as like any material when you synthesize it can get into trapped into a kind of kinetically trapped situation or uh, but in this cases most of these molecules advantages that you know that this can break and form very easily so as a result it will find the thermodynamic equilibrium and uh, uh, these polymers uh, one of the important aspect happen in this kind of polymerization is very similar to the classical polymerization we know that there are two mechanisms one is step growth and one is chain growth and uh, i'm going only going to talk about the chain growth mechanism and people found that very similar to the chain growth polymerization here also in supramolecular polymerization also there is something called nucleation growth polymerization so you have a monomer it forms a nucleation uh, which is the activation step and then immediately it propagate so the problem we faced why we did not have any structural control was uh, this nucleation step was although it's a kind of generally people say that nucleation is a energetically unfavorable process but what happens in this case of most of the supramolecular system which reported the energy barriers required for this process uh, it's not very high so as a result what happens is nucleation can happen spontaneously so if you introduce additional monomer into system to grow this polymer polymer chain length uh, it will start its own nucleation centers and you can imagine that that will kill your control on the dispersity so one of the challenge was to uh, control this nucleation process and everything i'm not going to the technical side of it uh, but if you another aspect so that is one is structural control and if you look into the another aspect uh, just look into this side of the energy landscape 
And so here it is about the equilibrium supramolecular polymerization. Here something I'm talking about out of equilibrium materials. It's very important. I'm sure this uh, Priyogin, everyone knows his uh, 1977 uh, Nobel Prize. He made a big statement, right? Equilibrium is death. Okay, so although everyone advises us be at equilibrium, be at equilibrium, but then equilibrium in all true sense, if we are at equilibrium, we are dead. So if you look into most of this biological process, they, this self-assembly process is not at equilibrium. They are at non-equilibrium. What I mean is, uh, so as I mentioned, most of the synthetic polymers so far was at thermodynamic equilibrium. But if you look into biological self-assembly, you need a continuous supply of energy okay, to remain in that assembled state and most of the cell functions are performed in that out of equilibrium state it's never at the equilibrium state so you look into the cell motility cell function everything the fibers or the protein assemblies which are always at out of equilibrium are performing those functions so if you think about materials if we can create out of equilibrium materials one can imagine we can interesting functions can be added to those materials so two aspects one is structural control and this one i would call as a temporal control so what happens is this is a microtubule self assembly all of you know when gtp binds this is a fuel which binds to this protein monomer it assembles and when gtp converts to gdp it gets disassembled right uh, so uh, so you need a continuous supply of fuel if you want to keep the material in this state and if the fuel runs out it comes back to the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. So this is uh, well studied in uh, physics. A lot of physics are involved in it. But then from a synthetic material or organic material to create a non-equilibrium, we need a new design principles. And in 1977, is uh, he proposed, and it's a coincidence that I also came into non-equilibrium at that year, 1977. Uh, so uh, let's move on. Uh, so if you look into this, uh, so what we have done. OK, uh, so uh, just uh, I don't know whether you are able to see it. So. Sorry, I wanted to show the title. Uh, so okay. so uh, uh, what I wanted to say that if you look into this, uh, if you look into this uh, synthetic system, this biological system, so the two aspects I have discussed about it. Uh, uh, one is the structural control, other one is out of equilibrium control. So if you look into nature, both nature again i'm going back to nature to get inspiration you can see that if you look into the actin self assembly which is a motor protein or by microtubule self assembly they have wonderful structural control they are always monodispersed and they are always out of equilibrium right and uh, so if you look into the synthetic okay so chemist point of view is that just look into the design principle so how does it work you see that protein actin protein monomer is always a kind of inactive state and there is a chemical reaction which triggers it and which converts into a kind of active state, which, which triggers the assembly process. And there is another orthogonal reaction, which is there to disassemble the material. So it's a very, from a chemist's point of view, it's a very simple design. We have a monomer. Let's suppose that it is in active form, so it will never assemble. And you need a fuel or a chemical stimuli to trigger it, uh, to convert into a kind of active state, which starts polymerizing to form a supramolecular polymer. And there is something, another stimuli it's not like a classical stimuli. It's, uh, it's always present in the system, operating at this system so that it can come back to the ground state. Uh, I'm making it too simple, I know. But if you have any doubts at later stage, I can uh, 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 I can clarify. So what we are trying to do was kind of chemical bio inspired chemical fuel driven system. So that probably that is a way to make life like synthetic materials. And uh, for a chemist, you can imagine that fuel. What are the fuels? Are, like in molecular machines, the fuels associated uh, available to us like an enzyme, reaction, redox driven, and so on. So uh, today, Franklin was mentioning about this redox driven, which we have recently shown. So uh, we have, especially last four to five years, we were trying to apply this chemical fuel driven supramolecular polymerization to show the concepts. We can use bio inspired strategies to make these materials, which are structurally well defined and also transient materials. Again, I don't want to trouble you with the too much of chemistry right now. Uh, so we have shown using enzymatically driven assemblies, chemically a simple chemical reaction driven assemblies, and very recently the redox driven assemblies. So the, what we have achieved by this, one of the biggest thing we achieved was uh, we can make materials which are monodispersed. What I mean is well defined. So the polydispersity of the synthesis, synthetic material like we made is very close to one, 1.1 and so on. Uh, so you know, you know that nature has its 
such well defined assemblies are ubiquitous in nature all of them are well defined so using the same strategy we are able to make materials which are uh, kind of well defined which are out of equilibrium and out of equilibrium for a material perspective i just this is our idea for students i'm like uh, uh, what can we achieve so something you can think about a kind of transient material right so uh, so what happens is you have two activator and deactivator fuel in your system you are converting monomers into a kind of assembled state uh, and the beauty is that we can, you know that as a chemist we can change the concentrations of the fuel right so by changing the fuel concentration what you do is you can define the lifetime of a material although it's called as a transient transient uh, the picture comes to our picture is very is, is spontaneous right no but the in this particular case just by using the chemical programming what we can do is we can control the lifetime of the material so you what i mean by a transient material here is it's a kind of pre-programmed lifetime materials which is having pre-programmed lifetime so you can imagine that you can change the to hours you can change to few minutes few seconds depending on the chemical programming we are doing to the material it's something nice right from a kind of a, a a kind of principle which learned from nature we can extend to materials and you can think about multiple applications so these are just few uh, ideas and like uh, this is at the beginning stages many groups are working also in this particular aspects uh, for example we can think about self erasing inks i'm sure you all of you watched mission impossible and you can uh, just after the message comes it the device self destruct so you can think about uh, kind of transient circuits like that transient catalysis and so on this is just nothing is there in real applications right now but i'm sure this out of equilibrium materials gives even for a material perspective it gives a lot of opportunities that's the message i wanted to give from that so uh, again we have to look back to nature are we really make life like materials because i sh i told you i'm like we can make structurally defined and we can make temporarily controlled material in terms of transient materials but are they really having creating a force because if you look into acting self assembly and everything there is a lot of force is stored in the system right and that is helping cells to move and so on so uh, so basically that assembly disassembly process we have to finally kind of convert into a kind of force this is something which we are now trying to again look back to nature and trying to make some kind of uh, uh, can we we are trying to we have modified the designs and we are now able to store a little bit these are very preliminary examples going on and you can see that the, you you can see that red color some things are uh, some things are moving right this is kind of silica beads fluorescent silica beads and this is moving mainly because of the assembly disassembly properties of this particular molecule so we are quite excited about this result still a lot of uh, control experience has to be done so this is probably again just showed this particular ongoing experiment i just showed to show that uh, we are again looking back to nature and trying to mimic their functions and next attempt is to probably uh, uh, try to store uh, kind of force in this kind of molecular fibers uh, we are going uh, so uh, i'm like i would like to probably towards the end of my talk i would like to say that this is an interesting field uh, we are learning slowly we are slowly progressing uh, but there are a lot of challenges as i told you just a two decades old research characterization of the structure is a monomer sequence because one of the another aspect we want to control is a kind of monomer sequence so if you look into nature again you know that 20 amino acids nature how well they are controlling uh, their sequence at sometimes abc so you can make wonderful materials with if you can control the sequence and this is something which we are now trying we have demonstrated i am not showing the result we have demonstrated with up to three monomers and uh, obviously as we go and more and more number of monomers the characterization we have limitations that's something which is challenging we need a predictive synthetic design this is something which i really highlight everywhere because this is a new field but if you want to really this field to become similar to the classical polymers uh, it the same design principle should be able to apply to a large number of molecules that's something which we are now trying to address uh, recyclable plastics as so all of you know that plastics one of the uh, plastics is wonderful material we cannot think about a life without plastics our polymers but one of the challenges that obviously all of you know is about is environment environmental issues because the plastic waste is accumulating everywhere you know the biodegradable biodegradable plastics are there but again it takes long time and it is not able to apply to a wide variety of monomers right all the plastics cannot be biodegradable so the uh, at least in europe and us there are a lot of thought process going on uh, kind of recyclable plastics 
uh, not biodegradable, but completely reuse the monomers and process it for something else. And this is kind of part of the circular economy they are talking about. But probably supramolecular polymers, at least few groups are now really looking into supramolecular polymers as a kind of candidate for recyclable plastics, because in principle, these are by weak interactions, you can regenerate the monomers and so on. So a lot of research uh, people are doing, or, or hopefully we can also contribute to that aspect. And something which is very interesting, the secondary nucleation, this is a concept which is again uh, gained from nature. Uh, we are talking about the primary nucleation events and then secondary nucleation is also an important aspect because uh, topology is an important thing. Because in classical polymers, there are branched polymers. We, we Right now, we don't have techniques to make branched polymers. So if you want to do that, only way is uh, uh, secondary nucleation. I just showing one article which appeared, uh, it's relevance to uh, SH because of a reason, I'll tell you. This is one of the nature article appeared recently from Shikia guys, group from Chiba. And you can see that there is a name Deepak Prabhu. He's also uh, there with you. Uh, so this is the first time probably a kind of secondary nucleation effect can be. So you can see that this is a nice Olympics uh, uh, symbol made up of Olympics logo made up of the supramolecular polymers. And this is possible only because capping the secondary nucleation. So uh, so I, I thought it is very appropriate to show this here because uh, Debeck and Shiki, both of them, we are very good friends for a long time. We many times discuss a lot of science. Uh, so it's nice that if you, and he's an, you have any kind of in-house expert on supramolecular polymer, probably you can always go back to uh, him to if you have more questions. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, conclude this very small talk. Uh, what I was trying to show you is kind of um, the challenges in this field, introduce you to the field uh, rather than discussing in deep the chemistry, because I thought that's more appropriate uh, to uh, motivate you. If you have more questions at any time, I'll be very happy to answer or in a kind of later occasion when I give a more kind of technical talk. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank entire Supra supramolecular chemistry group at Bangalore uh, because whatever I achieved is not my credit because their hard work uh, and their dedication speaks volumes of the, uh, I mean like their volumes of commitment is responsible for the uh, results whatever I'm having. So I'm glad that this is uh, now my third generation PhD students are going on. Uh, so a lot of visiting faculty, Jinu was there with us for some time. So a lot of postdocs, summer students, uh, many from Kerala did it this time also one summer student were supposed to come from SH Tevra to my lab, but unfortunately, uh, the due to the pandemic situation, we had to uh, cancel it. Last year, one student was the Ria. So uh, a lot of summer students uh, all contributed to my research. And as you can see that uh, some of the uh, first generation, first generation PhD students are already come back to India after their postdoctoral research and started uh, in some of the IITs. So thanks to a big thank you to all of them, because without their uh, uh, effort, nothing is possible. And before I stop, I think a uh, little bit to spend time to kind of kind of motivation to students. Uh, let me first talk about our no, uh, new chemistry unit. So I belong to a kind of department called new chemistry unit. It's very important. What is new chemistry? Uh, new chemistry is not the building name or the department name is new chemistry, not because it's a new department. Uh, but we are supposed to do new chemistry. And this is started by Professor Rao, Bharatna Professor Rao. All of you know that uh, he's the head of the department. Uh, the idea is that uh, so the chemistry is now borderless. It's no longer I mean like people. It's very difficult to say that I am an organic chemist, physical chemist, or inorganic chemist. It's highly interdisciplinary, and also it's very difficult to if you want to do really kind of uh, high high impact research. Uh, we have to collaborate with physics theoreticians and so on. So nowadays research has become more like kind of borderless, and uh, that is the exact concept. Professor Rao wanted to give uh, when he started this department in 2008. It's called New Chemistry Unit. And uh, myself and my colleagues are really working on the interfaces of chemistry with biology, materials, and so on. So the concept of chemistry has slowly changed. That's a message I wanted to give you uh, with this slide. And uh, also something which already touched upon. Uh, so it, I, I want all of you, the students who is listening to me, uh, doesn't matter whether you get an opportunity or not, uh, you should select your what you want to do, you have to select probably at the early stages of your career itself. Um, I had no, I mean, I had no clue what is the career in a science because it was only my love for chemistry which uh, prompted me to continue uh, chemistry because I qualified engineering examination with a uh, reasonably, I would have got into a reasonably good branch. But then that was the toughest decision at that time. Instead of saying no to the engineering and continue pursuing chemistry, a decision which is highly criticized by all well-wishers uh, because even now I think that is a trend uh, because when you consider the job opportunity, obviously the professional courses are 
uh, people prefer professional courses. Uh, but then uh, it was only the passion for chemistry which uh, put me to BSc chemistry when I continued in Maharaja's college and later at School of Chemical Sciences. So the uh, message I wanted to give was, uh, it was at School of Chemical Sciences, I got first hands-on experience with uh, this uh, research because uh, there, there was a kind of three months summer project. So three months project when I went to Professor Ajay Ghosh at East Rwandram. Uh, that is a, probably the first time I saw excitement in research because you make a molecule which no one has made in this world, right? That gives you kind of satisfaction for you. And also, uh, I saw the excitement on his eyes, my supervisor's eyes, that something great coming out. And slowly that excitement uh, transferred on to me. I decided probably science is my career. But just wanted to give a message that uh, I didn't know what is a career, but that situation has changed. Now uh, we know what is a career in science. All of us know we are wonderful teachers who uh, explain to you what is a science in career. So humble advice is that try to even masters, I would say a bit late, at the, if possible, at the undergraduate level itself, try to get exposed to research um, and see whether this is really uh, my taste or not. Because don't come to research if you are not really interested to do research, because that's very important. And uh, if you decided that at undergraduate level or something, I'm going into science, uh, something which I would suggest is uh, then approach the subject in a slightly different way. Uh, because don't uh, look really into only the marks in your examination because one thing you, I want all of you to this is some base some I'm a kind of ex, I mean a kind of experience I faced while sitting in the interview boards and everything uh, so I really want you to enjoy chemistry understand chemistry approach it with a kind of critical and analytical mind that's very important when you want to take a science as a career and uh, that was very lucky that I was exposed to such an, along with Franklin, Franklin knows very well. Uh, so we, when we were at School of Chemical Sciences, we got that free of, that free space to think more about, independently about uh, chemistry. And I think that is an important aspect wherever you are. I'm like, you are wonderful teachers in uh, Tevra. Uh, so use that, listen to them and use that time. If you want to really pursue in chemistry or any other subject as science as a career, uh, try to enjoy the subject and lead. This is kind of really kind of small advice to all of you from based on my own experience. Uh, uh, then uh, just for, I mean, there are wonderful opportunities how to expose to science. As I told, that is what I was very happy that there is a uh, MSc project award is given. Probably as I mentioned again, this is the probably the only chance for you, especially our students from Kerala studying in colleges. Probably this is the only chance for us to know what is research. So take it very seriously at that point. I'm, uh, I'm glad that it is getting appreciated uh, and awards are constituted for that. So from a student point of view, I, there are a lot of opportunities, summer research program from academy. It was not existing. It started very recently. A uh, lot of opportunity for you to get exposed to, you to science. Uh, I'm just uh, showing this slide only from a kind of new chemistry point of view. So we have multiple options for a faculty, students, uh, school students, undergraduate students to come over to JNCSR and probably to feel what is research. But always only only problem is we are very small. Uh, altogether, only we are 50 faculty. You can imagine there is a limitation for accommodating large number of students. But that's all, that limitation. But you can see that a person is very interested. There are opportunities. Uh, and obviously, you have now ICET Rwandram in Kerala. Uh, so a lot of IITs, IIT Palakkad. So so many opportunities, IACs and large number of ICES all over India. So a lot of opportunities are there. I want really all of you to make use of it. Uh, if you want to take uh, really science as a career and also probably a kind of research oriented uh, study, you should take it up uh, if you want to take it, uh, take research as a career. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you all of uh, for your attention. And uh, I would be very happy to once again, thank you for inviting me here for this Hattian Congress. And uh, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir for this wonderful talk as well as for the motivating words. Uh, we have some some time for a couple of questions. If any participants have questions, please feel free to ask. Principal Kayle. Yeah. So we have uh, our principal, Father Prashant, here. Hello, hello, Father. Yeah. Uh, hello, Subin. Good to see you. Good to see you. 
Uh, I was listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I invite Father Prashant for uh, giving giving away some words. Uh, but uh, have you already announced the results? Yep. Yeah, the results have been yeah, announced. No, that part I didn't, I didn't do. So uh, thank you, Zubin, first of all, to be, for being with us. It is really wonderful and very inspiring, especially to have shown that the possibilities are from very ordinary kind of circumstances how we can grow. And uh, why we shouldn't be um, taking up challenges. I, I really feel fascinated by the kind of decisions you have taken in such a set of example and a challenge before the youngsters. Thank you very much. And I was really wonderstruck by the, the initial part of the presentation. What a fabulous world is uh, science and our life and our molecule and the cells. It, it was really tremendous. I was really thrilled to see that. I, I'm, I'm jealous of science students that they are having the possibility of learning all these things. Uh, but I do not know to what extent are we trying to uh, optimize these opportunities. Uh, I really doubt. So at the PG level, at the fag end of the departure, uh, a set of students, 14 of them were selected and seven of them shortlisted. And out of them, uh, three have been awarded. I really congratulate all of them. I couldn't listen to all those presentations. But I think uh, our new education policy speaks about a very important thing. One is regarding multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity, that cutting across our narrow silos, as, as, as it is termed, to get out of that and try to see the broader world, the wider world, the big picture, and try to find the linkages around us. So that becomes very, very vital and important. And I think we shouldn't get stuck to our small world of cell biology and chemistry and stuff like that. It cannot be like that. There is no such existence. So I think that is a challenge, and I hope that uh, Dr. Vijay Dominic award um, will be an occasion to trigger off such inspirations further. And I thank um, Dr. Subhi's presence and I hope that there will be a time before long we will be on the campus and uh, really interact face to face with the students and further inspire them. And I hope that also our faculty colleagues will take uh, make sure that such uh, resources are being actually utilized for the benefit of the world and for the new generation. I also, I also thank uh, Dr. Jinu and all of the faculty members involved in this process. It was a very tedious process. Very, uh, uh, many people do not really realize what has gone in, behind that. Uh, what has gone behind the effort to organize this kind of thing. Yes, I think almost a month of work behind has happened. And I really appreciate the efforts taken by all of them. Also appreciate the efforts taken by the students. But I, I, there is no point in advising you, but the youngsters were still to go. From the presentations, I got the observation that sometimes we were all very, very shallow in our presentations. Maybe presentation itself was good, but why and hows of these things were uh, missing. That's what I heard. So I, I think that uh, the students will get to know why I, I want to do a research, on what topic, and why do I do this, and what what is the uh, why behind. Um, what I do. So I think you should have your own answers, not that somebody else will answer for you. Uh, I think that uh, research should help you to not only find the method of doing things rightly, but also uh, uh, develop a kind of curiosity to go beyond uh, the typical the phenomenon and understand the hows and whys and own it. It is my discovery. Finally, it is my ownership. So you are answerable to what you're going to present and what you're, what you're exploring. So that way, I hope you will take also responsibility for that. I also remember with great fondness our beloved Dominic sir, and also all other faculty members, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. C. Anas Francis and others who have been instrumental in sustaining this Party and Science Congress. So this is not again Congress or Communist Party, as you know, but we are getting together on a platform to share. That is con, and uh, coming together to share our views and our, our findings on a solid basis. I hope that will continue to happen. And I wish the gathering the uh, very best. I, I hope that's all for my today. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for the inspiring words. So now we are moving further to the faculty presentations on Nobel Prize winning topics of 2020.
The first presentation will be on Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year. I invite Dr. Grace Thomas of Department of Chemistry for presenting the topic. Uh, Dr. Grace, let me intervene before you start. Uh, maybe you would you would repeat this again, but uh, I, I would like I, I forgot to make this observation that this year Nobel Prize has shown that what a fabulous world is before us, and especially with I think at least minimum four women coming into the forum, uh, four uh, physics and chemistry, I, I believe. So that is great, and I, I feel a little jealous about these two people in chemistry because they are only fifty-five or fifty-four, and I'm older than them and having done nothing, I feel, uh, and they have done really, they have made a fabulous world before them. So I think there's a great opportunity, so many girls around us and into chemistry and all, you can do great things. So please, please uh, get inspired. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all. I think I'm audible. Yes, yes. Yes, miss. You're audible. Yeah, today, uh, I'm here to discuss about the uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry for rewriting the code of life. That is awarded to Emmanuel Chapendier and Jennifer Doutna for the development of a method for genome editing. As Father has mentioned, this year's Nobel Prize has gone to a women only team. And Emmanuel Chapendier, born in 1968 in France, has received her. A PhD from Pasteur Institute in Paris, and she is currently the director of the Max Planck Unit of the Sciences of Pathogens in Berlin, Germany. And Jennifer A. Doudna, born in 1964 in Washington, D.C., received her PhD from, in 1989 from Harvard Medical School in Boston, in USA. And currently, she is professor at the University of California in Berkeley and is the investigator of Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Coming to the discovery. To explain the discovery, we have to go from the big scale, things we can see, to the smallest pieces of life that are invisible to our eyes. A human being is made up of trillions of cells, and each cell is very tiny. As Subisar has already mentioned, in each cell, we have a genetic material called the DNA. DNA is very long and thin, and it is like a piece of string. And DNA is made up of building blocks called bases. The DNA in each cell contains about 6 billion of bases placed along the string in a particular order. This is what we call the code of life. From this code, Thousands of proteins are made in every cell that they can perform all kinds of the functions of our body. So this year's laureates, Emmanuel Chapendier and Jennifer Doutna, had developed an elegant system named CRISPR-Cas9, or simply genetic scissors, that can cut the DNA string at one and only one selective positions among all the billions of bases. The ability to cut the DNA where you want has revolutionized the life sciences. We can now easily edit genomes as desired, something that before was hard or even impossible. Today, CRISPR-Cas9 is a common tool in biochemistry and molecular biology labs. It's also used in plant breeding and for novel treatments of human diseases. The genetic scissors were discovered just eight years ago and have already benefited humankind greatly. So because of the development of new chemical tools, we know today that DNA sequences have a large number of different genomes, but merely reading this information is not sufficient to understand the life's inner workings. We also need to have tools so that we can change the information and find out about the functions. With the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9, that is the clustered, regularly interspaced, short, palindromic repeats, or the genetic scissors Emmanuel Chapendier and Jennifer Doudna has provided science with such a tool. We can now change the genetic information in any cell or any organism and we can find out the function of the genetic material. So the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 system 
comes from the studies of an ancient immune system present in bacteria and other organisms. Just as we are infected by viruses, bacteria can also be infected. And when they suffer a virus infection, and if they survive that infection, then they keep a piece of the viral DNA as a memory. And this is done in a specific region called CRISPR, where the bacteria have multiple small memory pieces of DNA. So you can see a part, this is a CRISPR part of the DNA where it is um, repeatedly interspaced with a part that contains the virus that already uh, affected the bacteria and the bacteria survived that infection. So this is where the information is stored, that is in the CRISPR gene, but CRISPR part of the DNA. But how can this piece of DNA actually defend the bacteria from later infections? In order to do that, you need to transcribe this region. That is what the bacteria did. You need to make a copy of the CRISPR DNA and make it into RNA, which is called the CRISPR RNA. In the next step, you need to actually take this CRISPR RNA and cut it up into small pieces. So you get smaller pieces of RNA that corresponds to one single infection event in the past. And how this processing as cutting up of RNA takes place is something that Emmanuel Chapendier demonstrated. She found a new small RNA molecule in the bacteria called the tracer RNA and she showed that this tracer RNA would bind to the long form of CRISPR RNA and then together with the two bacterial proteins, the Cas9 and RNA 3 would cut the long RNA molecule up into small pieces. Now there was a piece of RNA corresponding to a previous infection but how could the RNA piece actually protect the viruses? To answer this question, Emmanuel Chapendier and Jennifer Doudna teamed up. And together, the two scientists made a crucial discovery. They found, that, they found out that the tracer RNA that was found earlier, the small piece of CRISPR RNA together with the Cas9 protein formed the genetic molecular scissors and these scissors would use the CRISPR part of the complex and then search for viral DNA within the bacterial cell. And if there was a match where the RNA would match the DNA of the virus, then it would cut the viral DNA and inactivate the virus. This was a great discovery by itself. But the two scientists did not stop there they wondered if they could make this system even simpler because now they have two RNA molecules and one protein. So what they tried to do was to fuse the two RNA molecules into one single RNA molecule which they call a single guide RNA. And then together with the Cas9 protein could actually target and cleave the virus DNA in the test tube and they found that it could cleave. It worked very nicely. So they had now created a simple two component system. But what they also did was that they started to make artificial guide RNAs. They changed the sequence of the CRISPR part of the guide RNA and it turned out that they could actually cleave almost any sequence of DNA that they like to target. They had created a programmable machinery, a programmable genetic system that would be used to cleave the DNA in test tubes. A couple of years later, other scientists showed that it was also possible to do this in in vivo in cells. So in cells, what Chapendier had predicted already in the original paper has now found to be correct. This was a system that could be used to cleave any DNA in any cellular organism. And why this is possible and why it is important? 
because if you cleave the DNA at the precise site, you can use the cell zone machinery to actually change the sequence there. So if you cut and leave the DNA, then the cut will be repaired by the DNA repair system present in the cell. But this repair system is error prone. So there will be introduction of errors at the cut and this errors can inactivate the genetic material there and in turn turn the genes off or do some unexpected outcomes in many cases. Instead, if we want to make the genetic material vary in a specific way, then we have to edit it. For that, you can introduce a short DNA template. This extra piece of DNA with that similar to the region you want to repair can be used as a template and in this way, you can introduce specific changes to any genetic region or genomic region. So this is like the sib of your genes or something like that. If, you, if the um, uh, inserted part is compatible, then it can join the uh, cut DNA. So what can we use this for? This new technology has transformed all the molecular life sciences. We can now edit basically any GMO, genome and it can also be used to fix any genetic damage. For example, the damage that caused sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell disease is caused by a genetic mutation that produces a defective form of hemoglobin, a protein needed by red blood cells to nourish the body with oxygen. The defective hemoglobin turns red blood cells into deformed, sickle-shaped cells that get jammed inside the blood vessels, causing attacks of pain, organ damage, and often premature death. So, with this uh, development of this uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology, you can take out the stem cell from a patient and you can correct the mutation and then put the cells back. This is already done in patients with sickle cell anemia. The enormous power of this technology means that we need to use it with great care. But it is equally clear that this is a technology, a method that will provide humankind with great opportunity. Only imagination sets the limits for what this chemical tool that is too small to be visible with our eyes can be used for in the future. Perhaps the dream of curing genetic diseases will come true. So before concluding, I would like to mention uh, one or two points. As a concluding remark, I would like to say that as the Nobel Committee Chair said, we have looked into the positive sides of this technology only. But this technology can be as destructive and can be compared with the discovery of dynamite by Alfred Nobel. So we should be very, we should realize that and we should be very careful when you use this powerful tool. Again, one more thing is that this year's chemistry Nobel Prize has gone to biologists. So as Father and Subisar has already mentioned, there is no limit between chemistry and there is no border between chemistry, physics or biology. Everything is science only. So we are going back 150 years. Uh, uh, we are going back to 150 years where there was only science and mathematics. So we should encourage interdisciplinary areas and we should have a thorough knowledge of basic sciences to go ahead. Thank you for your kind. Uh, listening and if you have any questions I'm happy to ask. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Grace. Next I would invite Dr. Jimmy Sebastian of Department of Physics to discuss about the Nobel Prize winning topic in physics this year. slide visible yes I can okay
Okay, uh, uh, so I will be talking about the Nobel Prize in Physics. So I would like to give a flavor of the Nobel Prize. But I will not go in great detail because most of the audiences here are basically uh, the graduate students or the master students. So this year, Physics Nobel Prize has gone to the theory of black holes and the uh, discovery of supermassive objects. Now, please keep in mind the word supermassive objects. So the physicists who received the Nobel Prize, so half of it has gone to Roger Penrose for uh, the theoretical works on uh, um, black holes, and the other half has gone to uh, Andrea Gass from California, uh, University of California, and uh, Reinhard Genzel from uh, Max Planck Institute. Uh, in so um, uh, the Roger Penrose had done uh, analysis of black holes and Andrea uh, Genhens and uh, Reinhard Genzel had done the experimental observation. Yeah. Okay. The theoretical, I mean, the Nobel Committee had said that the prize is given to Roger Penrose for the discovery that the black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. Yeah. So let's rewind back to 334 years. To 1686. That's when Isaac Newton proposed the theory of gravity. So what Isaac Newton had said was, if two objects, Sun and Earth, then they will be attracted by a force which is directly proportional to their mass and which is inversely proportional to the square of the radius, or I would say the square of the distance between them. The thing that the Isaac Newton had proposed was the corpuscular nature of light, yeah, which was later on actually uh, contested by Huygens with the wave theory of light. So Isaac Newton was the first guy who actually proposed the corpuscular nature of light. He told light consists of very tiny particles, yeah, very, very tiny particles. So these were the two theories, the big theories that had come forward, uh, classical theories that had come forward uh, in uh, 1686. So a lot of physicists were working on, uh, on this, they analyzed this, they studied it. Then there was this uh, uh, Anglican clergyman called Father John Michel. Now he uh, took hold of these equations, and then he thought, what happens if the mass of the object becomes very huge? And then he found out that, okay, we have these stars, we have the sun, uh, a star, and suppose the mass of the sun is like 500 times the mass that it has now. And then he put the equations of Newton, and he found out that the, if such a huge star exists, then the gravity, or the force of gravity will be so huge that even light, small corpuscular particles of light, will not be able to escape such a dark or such a star. And when light doesn't escape, it will be an absence of light is darkness. So it will be dark. So he named it dark star. Yeah? And he told that dark star can not be observed directly. Now, this is the same John Michel who has actually, uh, who had actually uh, developed the uh, torsional pendulum setup, which later on Cavendish used to measure the mass of Earth and the density of Earth. Forward to 121 years to 1905. And some physicists called Albert Einstein. 1905, while working in the office as a clerk with his passion for physics, developed for physics, one of them being the uh, theory of special theory of relativity. So what does the special theory of relativity mean? The special theory of relativity means that the, uh, the laws of physics are the same in all non-accelerating frames of reference, or I would call it non-accelerating observers. That is, if you are not accelerating, you are either stationary or you are velocity, then the laws of physics that you will see will all be the same. Next, that he had proposed is that the speed of light in vacuum law. That is, is independent of the speed of the observer. That means if the light is moving, and if you look at the trains, if one train, if both the trains are moving in the same direction, then if you look at the 
speed of the other train from your train, then you will find that train to be moving slower. But that's not the case with light. With light, always, it will move at the velocity 3 into 10 raised to 8. Meter per second is a constant. And uh, it will be the same, whichever reference frame you are. Then you worked for 10 years, 10 years to incorporate acceleration into, or gravity, uh, or the acceleration into this uh, special theory of relativity. Then by doing that, in 90, the general theory of relativity. In general theory of relativity, Einstein came up with the very revolutionary theory that as Newton has previously told, that gravity is a force, is no longer true, but gravity is nothing but the deformation of space-time. So gravity is not a force, but it is the deformation of space-time. What do you mean by that? Now, if you look at this figure here, the one on the right and one on the left, now if you look at the figure on the left, you will see a massive object in the space-time fabric. So scientists like to call it as fabric. So we are all engulfed by the space-time fabric. And the space-time fabric is nothing but a coordinate system which is formed by space and time as one of the coordinates. So we are no longer working in the three-dimensional space system, but we are working in a four-dimensional space system, which actually Einstein had borrowed. The idea had borrowed from Minkowski. Minkowski was one of the originators of uh, the four-day space-time. So Einstein actually used those ideas into his uh, general theory of relativity, and he had found that a massive object, yeah, something like this, if it's a sun, it creates a huge dent in the fabric of space-time. Small or a less massive object will create a lesser dent. So what happens? A light that or any object that travels would actually be seeing this curvature and will take its direction. It's like you know if you are traveling in a road and if suddenly the road's direction changes, you will also change. So light will also follow the curvature of space-time. A massive object will have the space-time curve on all sides of it. Yeah? And what you can see on the right is actually an animated GIF where you can see that a object that is moving in space-time, how near the object, the space-time is deformed. Yeah? Basically, that's what is gravity. That's actually the predictions and the beautiful predictions of uh, general theory of relativity. Same year, yeah, th that was the World War I and Professor Carl Schwarzschild. He was actually deployed in the army and he was working uh, in the war front. And during this time, you know how difficult it is, he got hold of this theory of general theory of relativity from a, uh, which Einstein had written and was working in the evenings after the war in his um, bunker uh, and tried to solve the equations that uh, Einstein had solved. So Einstein had solved the, uh, equations, general, uh, the equations of general theory of relativity by taking the coordinate system as Cartesian coordinate. So what Schwarzschild, and uh, because of taking it as a Cartesian, that means uh, X, Y, Z, yeah? So uh, he had a big limitation of uh, getting a perfect solution. So he had made some assumptions. So what Carl Schwarzschild has done, that he actually used the spherical polar coordinates and was able to see, uh, was exactly solved the general theory of the, uh, the um, equations of general theory relativity, the field equations of general theory of relativity. And what he had arrived at was actually, he arrived at what we call the Schwarzschild radius. Yeah. So um, the radius actually describes the event horizon of any object. Yeah. We will come to it, how it describes something. So he had actually sent this letter to Einstein, and you see he has written, as you see, God treated me kindly enough, in spite of the heavy gunfire, to allow me to get away from it all and walk in the land of your ideas. So that was Carl Schwarzschild, yeah? working in the war zone, solving the equations of general theory of relativity. And in 1965, there are a lot of scientists who are working on this, but you know, Einstein himself didn't believe in black holes. Why? Because nature doesn't like singularity. What do you mean by singularity? So everything in nature, and mathematics and in nature, everything is well-behaved. So in mathematics, all the functions should be well-behaved. What do you mean by non-well-behaved function? That means the function which is not differentiable or which cannot be integrated at a particular point of time. For example, if you look at a, 
uh, something that goes to infinity, something that actually at a region will blow up to really infinity, goes really, really high. So such a thing never exists in nature. That's what Einstein believed. So Einstein uh, always left out these equations. But there were a few scientists who actually uh, took hold of it. One of them was Roger, uh, I mean, uh, Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose, in his 1965 physical review letter paper, told that unlike Schwarzschild, who had assumed a spherical symmetry, it's not really necessary that spherical symmetry is needed, but you can also have a quadrupolar symmetry, which can give rise to a black hole. So if you look at this figure, you see space-time fabric that has been created a small dent by a heavy object like sun, a white dwarf, which creates a bigger dent, a neutron star, because it's more dense, creates a bigger, I mean, much more uh, bigger dent in this time fabric at a black hole, which goes to infinity. That is a singular point. Yeah. So what it gives us is actually a black hole is like a, a region in space time where you, you can define an event horizon, the rate of which is uh, how Schwarzschild had described. It's uh, is the region after which be retried back. That is, the object will move with such high velocities that we know uh, with relativity that when you move with the speed of uh, uh, light, then what happens is actually the time dilation takes place. What happens? Time nearly stops. So what happens as you, as the object moves to the uh, black hole, it actually reaches a region where it will take infinite time to reach the singular point. So all the physics breaks down. So this was uh, Roger Penrose had uh, identified that in any geometry, Roger Penrose was a very good uh, mathematician with a very good understanding of geometry. That was his advantage. And by using some of the theories that other scientists have come, uh, put forward, he was able to devise a, uh, or conclude that black holes are inevitable even without spherical symmetry. So now comes the experiments. All this theory were there. People, and then Stephen Hawking was also there. Penrose on black holes. And unfortunately, he's no more. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have also been considered by the Nobel Prize Committee. Now, uh, as experiments, as theories are uh, progressing on black holes, a large part of scientists throughout the world skeptical whether such kind of objects really existed in nature or in the universe. As Einstein, the greatest monk of last century, believed singularities are not loved by nature. That's not how, that's what, uh, that's the usual phrase that Einstein uses. Yeah. Now, experiment. The second part of the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. So this was an observational astronomy experiment. So our galaxy, which is Milky Way, so there were two scientists, one of them being Andrea Guess, who was working at the Keck Observatory Dome in Hawaii, America, who was a professor, who is a professor of University of California, Los Angeles. She was working for 25 years, looking at a at the center of our galaxy. <clears throat> now, why do you think it's so difficult? That's, a, that's the question I want to answer. You see, um, in the uh, 1970s, scientists had identified that from the center of our galaxy, the radio waves were emitted. It was an astronomical radio source at the center of our galaxy. But nobody understood and nobody could visualize or see what was really happening there. What was limiting us? We were limited by technology. That is, we didn't have powerful telescopes. We didn't have the technology with the telescopes to really look with higher resolution at the center of the galaxy. You should imagine these are very, very light years, far away distances. Yeah. So Andrea Guess then went to Keck Observatory. She told them to modify the observatory to suit infrared uh, observation and the software program that was running it. And she really worked on uh, this observatory for 25 years, looking at the center at Sagittarius A star, which was the radio source uh, um, emitter. Yeah. Then there was Reinhard Genzel, who was from Lang Institute, 
of extraterrestrial physics. So he was using European Southern Observatory, very large telescope, ESO VLT. Yeah? So he was using this telescope trying to see the center of our galaxy. He was also working for three decades. So remember, these two scientists, that is Andrea Guess and Reinhard Genzel, were working for three decades just to see any signs of, of uh, to just to get enough data that uh, would prove the general theory of relativity or might give insight into what is really at the center of our galaxy. So they found out, both of them, nearly at the same time, found out that, and it was a really fierce competition between them, a healthy and fierce competition. That at the center of, of the galaxy, in Sagittarius A star, there is a star called S2, which was revolving at the speed of 2% of the velocity of light around the center, such that it could complete one orbit in 17 years. You should imagine that our sun takes 200 million years to complete one orbit around the center of our galaxy. And here was one star that was revolving at a very short radius. The radius of the orbit was very small, and it was revolving in, uh, uh, in the radius, the radius, about this radius, with a time period of 17 years. Yeah? And this can easily be, you can even use Kepler's equations to find out what is the mass about which this star is rotating. So they found out that at the center of the galaxy, the mass would be 400 uh, or four, four, sorry, four million mass, solar mass. That means the mass is similar to uh, four million times our sun. Yeah. So only one object can have this much massive, and that's a black hole. So that's also one of the reasons why Andreas Guess and Reinhard Genzel were considered for the Nobel Prize. Now, after all, same thing, you know, you have our um, Milky Way galaxy, and at the center of it, uh, our sun is somewhere here, and at the center of this, there was the black hole. That's what. And the trick led in two things. I mean, it is also the victory of technology, because uh, one of the things was uh, the scientists shifted to infrared observ observation because uh, the ordinary light or the light was creating a problem uh, blocking, blocked by the dust that is present between the galactic dust that is present between Earth and the center of the galaxy. Second thing was the use of very big telescopes and with adaptive optics. That was one of the uh, main reasons that in 2019, the first picture of black hole was taken by the telescope Event Horizon. What is Event Horizon? It's a series of telescopes or a, a chain of telescopes that were set on Earth uh, to make the size of the telescope as big as the size of the Earth. And that took the picture of the first black hole in 2019. So it validated the whole theory of black holes. So it gave, gave rest to all those who told black holes never existed. And that's why the Nobel Committee decided to give the prize to Roger Penrose, Andrea Gass, and Reinhard Genzel for theory and experiment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Dr. Ragam PM from Department of Zoology to describe on the 2020 Nobel Prize winning discovery in medicine. We request uh, the presenters to restrict the discussions to eight minutes. Dr. Ragam. Mm -hmm. 
Dragon Mr. Uh, your slide is visible. You can see your presentation here. Uh, Ragamis, I think there is some technical issues here. We will be moving uh, to the next pres uh, presenting person, that is Dr. Aparna, and later on we will be coming back to your presentation. And next we have Dr. Aparna from Department of Economics to present on the topic, the Nobel Prize winning topic on economic sciences this year. Uh, uh, Dr. Abarna, your presentation is visible here. Your slide. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're audible. Yes, we can hear you. Welcome to all. Uh, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science 2020. I think the slide is not moving. So before uh, explaining uh, regarding the Nobel Thing that there is uh, no Nobel Prize for science as such. Uh, in uh, the he actually established a prize for only five when that was uh, Later on, that is in the year 1968, this various Eriks Bank. Bank of Sweden, in order to in order to celebrate their 300. Uh, anniversary, they actually establish a prize for economic science and that along with the Nobel Prizes. So in a true sense, uh, there is no prize for economics, so, yet it is the... So coming to my presentation, uh, the Svoris Eriks Prize uh, in Economic Science in memory of Alfred Nobel was awarded time to two U.S. eminent economists, Paul R. Milgrom and and their contribution is for improving the auction theory and inventions of new auction format, especially for the allocation of scarce resources in an economy. I'll come to uh, that later on. So let's just uh, look at their profile, the economist profile. They are popularly known as these uh, two economists are popularly known as the South Peace of economic world. South Peace is nothing but it's the famous uh, multinational situated in New York and in uh, since their area of uh, interest, since their area of specialization is uh, auction theory and auction related strategies and especially the auction format, they are popularly known as the South Bees of Economic World. So uh, this is Robert but uh, Butler Wilson. Uh, he earned his bachelor's and degree from Harvard University and he's right now working as an emeritus professor in Stan uh, Stanford University. And his uh, main area of specialization are management science and business economics. And he's an expert in game theory. That is the theory related to the oligopoly market strategies. And in that, especially the option designs and competitive bidding strategies. Robert uh, He was actually the student, doctoral student of Robert Wilson. 
Okay, that student and teacher uh, together got a Nobel Prize for Economic Science in 2020. And he completed his bachelor's from Michigan University and graduated from Stanford University. And he's, uh, he's also working as a, an emeritus professor in Stanford University. And his specialization in area is also auction theory and the pricing strategies. So before that, what is auction, before going to what is auction, uh, you may all all familiar with what an auction is. So, uh, the discovering of a price of a particular commodity through the process of our copy. Okay, so coming to what is an auction theory is all about. Auction theory, which studies how auctions are designed, that is the design of an auction, which actually uh, explain what all are the rules auction and in what way the bidders are supposed to behave and at the same time what should be the outcome of the uh, auction at the end and it, it obviously differs from uh, one commodity to the, to the another so it, this auction format or auction design differs based upon the uh, also it differs from the person the entity who contact yes Abadam, yes. could you please uh... Put that in the presentation mode. Uh, this is uh, yeah. this is not in the slideshow mode or presentation mode. Could you please shift that to presentation mode? The slides. Is it okay? Okay. Is is it? Uh, it would be much more better. Uh, yeah, it's now. It's now good. Yeah. Better. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can continue. Uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is what an auction theory is all about, auction design is all about. So what all are the rules to be governed in conducting an auction and wo in what way the bidders are supposed to behave in an auction and also what is the outcome to time this each auction format differs from one commodity to another that is it depends upon the nature of the commodity and it also differs depend uh, you know based upon the entity which conducts that auction that is if it is a government entity their motive will be a market welfare and if it is a private entity definitely their motive will be profit okay so depends upon that is auction design change coming to how important an auction in especially in economics uh, auction is the most widely used and most efficiently used resources. Okay, as we all know that and the resources, the natural resources to satisfy these ones are very limited in nature. So, you know, to allocate these scarce resources efficiently process of auction is very important and what is the problem uh, you know already we have already traditional auction some similar designs but this design has some limitations in allocating the scarce resources that is why uh, these two economists come up with something new so the traditional auction method but the highest open bidder getting the property that you may all know that Leila, that is uh, those who uh, you know uh, bid the highest rate will problem of lobbying that is those who are closer to the auction uh, contacting entity can lobby the entity and uh, use that uh, auction so that that in the case of a common good distribution or allocation that can become a big problem so in order to solve this problem these two economists come up with some new auction format or auction design As I told you, auctions are everywhere. You can see everywhere in the modern world auctions. And even the sale of a grocery, that is a simple grocery sale, it knowingly or unknowingly, the retailer apply the auctions. Uh, and whatever be the nature of good, that is if it is a very, you know, capital good, like very scarce goods, like spectrums, minerals, or vegetable uh, or a simple good like vegetable or fruits anything but uh, the the point here is that auctions are at the core of allocation of skills resources in a market economy uh, i can give you an example that is that is if you if you uh, search something in uh, google there are so many advertisement will pop up and 
company actually received a right to advertise from Google uh, through the process of auction. And Google is the one company which widely uses the uh, auction format uh, developed by Milgro. That Today explain it is for the improvement in the auction theory and invention of new auction format for allocating or for distributing public goods or scarce resources, they received this award. And it was Mr. Wilson who first created the framework for auction, especially with a common value of the auction item. So his famous framework is based upon the value of an item. What is the common value of an auction item? It can be defined as a value which is uncertain or unknown beforehand, but in the end, it is same for everyone. The thing is that I can I can simply explain it with an example. That is, if there is a full of a jar, a jar, okay, a jar full of one rupee coin is the auctioned item. So let us suppose that there is a jar full of one rupee coin is the one we are going to auction. And let us suppose that there are ten thousand coins in the jar. Okay. Job is that is ten thousand rupees. That is what is the common value of what is called like that commodity. That is the actual of the true value of that particular commodity. And at the same time, there is another valuation that is what is called private value because each bidder will be having a private valuation regarding the commodity, regarding the price of that commodity, right? Because bidder do not have complete information regarding the auction commodity. So that uh, what they will be doing is they will have a private that may or may not be equal to the intrinsic or the common value of the commodity. Okay. And this, uh, you know, uh, created the framework with the help of or with the, uh, you know, common value of the auction item. And uh, uh, Paul Milgram actually extended this uh, theory or this uh, framework including or incorporating the private value as well. So common value plus private value. And it was Wilson who is credited with identifying another problem which exists in auction market. That is what is called a winner's curse. Winner's curse is nothing but take the same example of jar. So the value of that auction is 10,000 rupees. There are so many bidders. And each bidder may say or uh, bid some other, I mean, uh, some estimated price or with their, uh, I may say uh, 10,000 rupees for the commodity, uh, 25, some other is 30,000. So many values will come up. And that will depend to the one which, uh, who uh, bid the highest rate, right? So maybe the one who bid for 30,000 rupees. So even though from the auction point of view, he is the winner, actually he is a loser. Why? Because he is receiving a commodity worth of 10,000 and for that he is paying almost 30,000 rupees. So there comes the problem of overpricing of the commodity. And at the same time, this winner's curse problem can create underpricing also. That is, if all the uh, you know bidders are quite con uh, cautious about this winner's curse problem, they may always bid at a lower rate. So finally, the commodity will be sell off at a lower rate uh, than the intrinsic value. So whatever it may be, overpriced or underpriced, in the case of a scarce resource, or especially in the case of a public good or a common good, it is quite inefficient. So in order to solve this winner's curse, they come up with something new or they come up with some new auction format. Finally, this is their auction format. Their auction format is known as simultaneous multi-round auction format, okay? SMRA, simultaneous multi-round auction. And this is first used by United Nations uh, Federal Communication uh, communication uh, commission that is FCC needed needed a new way to allocate radio fre frequencies that is way back in 1990 they used this and even in 2017 the spectrum allocation by the United States was done through with the help of this SMRA auction and th that was considered as one of the biggest auction ever happened in world 
And uh, so coming to what is this SMRA, simultaneous multiple round action. And this uh, earlier, that is uh, earlier, there is these, uh, you know, traditional uh, size, simple format, auction format. Uh, what is happening is that the whatever the auction, the commodity, the commodity is given at an individual basis. So as against to this, this SMRA technique, tell them to use or tell them to bid the commodity at on the basis of a bundle. That is, it is offered, the, bundle, the biddable items are offered simultaneously to the bidders and they can bid for any particular portion of the commodity. With your, uh, with your example, that if you take into consideration the spectrum allocation in India, the India, the geographical zone of India is divided into almost 15 to 20 zones. And from, for each zone, or the bidding process is happening simultaneously. Okay, the bidding process is happening simultaneously. And the companies involved in bidding can actually, uh, you know, bid for any particular zones uh, spectrum rights or for uh, one or more uh, zones or two or three zones depends upon the rule of the government. So a portion of the spectrum right is given to a particular company so that the company will receive that commodity at a reasonable price so easily they, they will be charging the price for the uh, you know, mobile network or whatever it is from the consumer at a cheaper rate. So fine, it simply means that the public good or the common good is distributed efficiently so that the consumer will get it at a say, cheaper rate or reasonable rate through this simultaneous, uh, you know, uh, multi-round auction method. Okay, this is their contribution all about. And the Nobel Committee clearly pointed out that this is such a beautiful example of how a concrete theoretical basis can generate into an invention which actually help or benefit the society as a whole. And uh, another distinguishing feature of this year's uh, economic Nobel Prize is that both the same people develop the theory and the same people, you know, application level also coming from them, them. That is the, both are, uh, you know, their contributions. So uh, finally, uh, I just concluded with that, hey, this particular, you know, uh, invention of what is called discovery is actually benefited the buyers, sellers, and as a society as a whole. So from a welfare point also, it has its importance. So undoubted, undoubtedly this, uh, year's Nobel Prize is uh, so much deserving to these two eminent economists. So that's all about uh, today's presentation. Thank you. If you have any queries, you can. Thank you, Aparna, ma'am. Uh, due to this time constraint, we are moving forward to our next presentation, that is the presentation by Dr. Ragam, PM from Department of Zoology on 2020 Nobel Prize winning discovery in medicine. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're audible. Okay. Uh, so, uh, taking into consideration the time restriction, I'll make it a little faster and also a little more brief than what I had actually planned. So, this year's Nobel mm -hmm. Prize in Physiology or Medicine goes for the discovery of hepatitis C. So, these are the stalwarts, Dr. Halvey J. Alter, Michael Hufton, and Charles M. Rice. This is the Star, the hepatitis C virus, the colored electron microscopy image. Now, the moment we say hepatitis C, the question is, are there other types? Of course, there are. There are five types of hepatitis C belonging to different families. But hepatitis C is an RNA virus, and it is only transmitted through blood. It is so small that even under electron microscopy, the images are not that very easy to identify, or it's not very clear enough. There is no vaccine, so which means that you cannot prevent it, but it is curable. So once there is an infection, there is always a chance that, a greater chance that if it has not entered the chronic stage, it is treatable. What does the World Health Organization have to say on hepatitis C? It is said that it is, this is a data as on 2016, which says that there are around 71 million people who have chronic hepatitis C infection. And uh, as of date, 4 lakh people have died. 
So uh, hepatitis C, actually there are two ways in which the infections can be or the symptoms can be observed. You have got the acute as well as the chronic. So when you say acute, as soon as hepatitis C comes in, uh, the person begins to show certain symptoms. So that becomes a little more treatable, okay? And it becomes a little more easier to understand the symptoms and go ahead with treat treatment. But in some cases, the people remain asymptomatic and that becomes a little dangerous. In the sense that uh, once it begins to manifest itself, probably a few months later on, the conditions become a little severe with cirrhosis and uh, liver cancer happening. So this is about a rough idea about hepatitis. So acute hepatitis, the symptoms are loss of appetite, vomiting, fatigue, and jaundice, whereas chronic hepatitis is cirrhosis and liver cancer. Now earlier I had shown you the electron microscopic image. Now this is the schematic or an illustration of the virus as such. And uh, this virus has got an envelope, it's got a protein coat, and the genome is an RNA genome. RNA is a positive strand RNA which is found here. It's also got a glycoprotein uh, on its envelope. And uh, it's actually there are two, E1 and E2. And one that is given below is the hepatitis C virus genome. The 5 prime end has got the structural genes, whereas the 3 prime end is more of a conserved sequence. Now, this is the award uh, winning work, or this just gives a brief uh, idea about what the entire thing is. Now, we can see the images of the healthy liver, the change in coloration. That is the first stage uh, after infection, the second one. The third one, cirrhosis, becomes is the chronic stage. And uh, the next one is the hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, what are the awards given for? Now, three people have been given the Nobel Prize. So this is a work which started way back in 1970 by Harvey J. Alter. His main work was the identification of the virus. He is the person who identified that there was a virus which was causing hepatitis. The next one, uh, which led to the isolation of the virus that is uh, the credit for that is given to Michael Hopton. And then we have Charles M. Rice, who said that the virus independently is capable of causing the infection. So I'll move on to each person's work a little bit in detail, but not much taking time into consideration. So Harvey J. Alter has got the distinguish uh, of uh, working with Barack Bloomberg. Uh, Barrett Bloomberg got the Nobel Prize in 1976 for hepatitis B. So with this idea, he moved to the U.S. National Institute of Health, and he was in the blood bank. So during his work there, he understood that um, uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, all those were identified and a lot of work was going on. And uh, what he observed was that there were so many patients who were developing a new kind of a a viral, I mean, a new kind of a liver disease, and that was through blood transfusion. So, with this, with the idea of hepatitis A and hepatitis B, when they did a number of tests, it was found that it was not at all attributed to hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is normally the common kind of jaundice which we normally find, where the transmission is through water and through food. So, uh, hepatitis B is transmitted through blood and other body fluids. So uh, it was found that in 20% of the patients who were getting this post-transfusion associated hepatitis, only 20% was hepatitis B. So what happens to the remaining 80%? The remaining 80% again was not attributed to hepatitis B. It should have been something different. So then again, uh, he found that in some people there was this acute condition and in some people, there was a chronic manifestation months later. So then he came to a conclusion that maybe two different viruses are involved in bringing about this post-transfusion hepatitis. And further work with lots of uh, evidences which they had, because they had in mind two viruses. So with uh, further work, he came to a conclusion that it is not hepatitis A, it is not hepatitis B. So, and it was not even known whether it was a virus. So they simply named it non-A, non-B hepatitis, that is N-A-N-B-H. Now this case of uh, N-A-N-B-H patients, it was increasing 
in a very alarming way. Then later on, they got an animal model. So normally when we do certain experiments, when it comes to physiology, we require animal models. And the only animal model which was found to show similar symptoms of hepatitis was chimpanzee. So with this primate model in hand, they were now able to transfer this disease onto chimpanzees, collect the liver cells and find out what changes are there. So with this kind of a work, they now were able to get the plasma from the chimpanzee. And when it was isolated, he found that it was a virus. And he also found that this virus had a lipid, uh, which is present on in all, all of the enveloped viruses. And it also had a diameter of approximately 30 to 60 nanometer. So with this, he came to a conclusion that this is a uh, this is a unknown virus. Now we'll come into Michael Houghton's work. Now with this idea of uh, the NANDH virus, the next thing was that virus is now discovered. Now we need to know what it is. We need to isolate the virus if further work can be done. So Michael Houghton, he's a British scientist working in the University of Alberta. So he began to do a lot of experiments. He began to screen the DNA fragments. And uh, um, a lot of primate model experiments were done. So in the initial stages, what he did is uh, he simply tried to uh, isolate the, uh, the virus or something from the, from the plasma of the infected chimpanzees and then inject it back into chimpanzees and see if it works. But unfortunately, it did not work that way. The infection was not observed. So he tried a novel method, a novel immune screening approach was done. So he worked along with Key Lim Chu and George Koh. So uh, the trio, in fact, the entire credit should, should go to the trio. It, it is not exactly Houghton's work alone. So what they did is a novel immune screening approach where they generated the RNA from the plasma of the infected chimpanzees. And from this RNA, they made the DNA using reverse transcriptase enzymes. And this CD, they made a cDNA library. And they stored this uh, cDNA libraries in lambda bacteriophage. Then what they did is they had to find out uh, if these viral antigens um, can be expressed or if we can find out whether these viral antigens are actually present. So what he did is uh, it was found that in all of these hepatitis uh, patients, their body develops antibodies. Okay, so, uh, so he, what he did is these viral antigens were now uh, added with the antibodies which he had collected from the patients, uh, human patients. So after screening, it was found that only one colony did not contain the chimpanzee or the human DNA sequences. So it was a viral signal that they were looking out for. And it was just one signal, single clone that they got from the one million bacterial colonies that they had made. So after doing such a massive work, they were finally lucky in getting that one single so further analysis of this virus uh, or further analysis of this particular viral agent gave them an understanding that it was a positive stranded RNA genome and uh, the virus was a, uh, it's something new. It is, they named it hepatitis C because A and B had already gone. It was already discovered. So they named it hepatitis C and it belonged to a new flam family called the Flavi Viridae family. And they also found that this, this viral sequence is almost the same as that of what was got from these NA and BH infected chimpanzees. So which means that this NA and BH and what uh, Houghton had actually identified were the same. So based on this, he also developed immunoassay techniques whereby uh, we can uh, identify or we can diagnose if uh, people have the hepatitis C infection. So this was a, a, a wonderful uh, relevation which was given to the field of medicine. Now comes the, the contribution of Charles M. Rice. So what did Charles M. Rice do? Now uh, for any agent to be a proven 
organism or a proven agent of a disease, it must be shown that this particular agent is capable of causing the infection on its own and does not take the aid of other factors. So, uh, so Charles M. Rice took it upon him to prove that this virus is capable of reproducing all the acute as well as the chronic hallmarks of the disease. So what was the first thing? So he was, uh, uh, he also worked along with Kunitada Shimotono uh, from the National Cancer Research Institute in Tokyo. And they both were working simultaneously. And on further analysis of the uh, viral genome, they found that the three prime end of the virus is a conserved non-coding region. Whereas uh, the uh, other regions, they, they are not, they are coding regions coding for both the structural as well as the non-structural uh, proteins. Uh, I mean, the structural as well as the non-structural non regions. Now, what Rice did is he constructed viral RNA genomes by maintaining the conserved three prime region. And, and, and using this uh, artificially constructed viral RNA genomes, he injected them into the liver of chimpanzees and he found that uh, it was not causing any kind of an infection or rather the vi virus was not replicating. Now, this was a setback. So, then came the idea that RNA virus replication is error prone, which means that every time the RNA virus replicates, there is always a chance that uh, a number of mutations happen and they keep changing. So, now he had to look out for those RNA genomes, which could be the conserved regions as well as the regions which are necessary to uh, necessary for them to replicate as well as cause infection. So this again is the next step. He had to engineer a new set of RNA genomes by maintaining the three prime conserved region and, uh, and also consensus sequences which can eliminate the possibility of certain uh, mutations from happening. Now when this engineered RNA was injected into the liver of chimpanzees, uh, it became successful. So all the acute as well as the chronic uh, symptoms were observed within chimpanzees. Now this was the breakthrough or this was the final proof that hepatitis C virus is capable of causing infection on its own. Now once this was established, next um, we had to repeat these experiments and on a repetition by Jen's book, it was found that this experiment is repetitive. It can be reproduced. And it was what experiment that Charles Rice had done was right. Now, the work of these three scientists paved the way for the development of the antiviral drugs that are actually being used today for the treatment of hepatitis C. So in the initial stages, once it is identified, we can easily treat them. So the combination of drugs that is presently used to treat is called the directly acting antivirus DAAs. So, uh, so this is a, yes, it's over. This is a reference okay. that uh, this is a reference that I had gone through for the uh, for the presentation. And thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Raga, ma'am. Uh, now I request Dr. Shijo Vergis from Department of English to discuss on the Nobel Prize in Literature awarded this year. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, you are audible, you sir. Me? Yeah, right. I can hear you. Am I visible? Yes. Yes. Oh, I want Yeah. <clears throat> yes, the slides. Hope are you can see my screen. presentation. Yes. yes, sir. All right, thank you. So I'll start, uh, and I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, maybe after uh, an extensive discussion on science and uh, Nobel Prize winners in science, uh, let's take a detour 
uh, in literature, the why of uh, someone's winning a Nobel Prize is more ambiguous than the why of a natural scientist winning it. There is a difference. So uh, while one, while science looks out, literature tries to look within. The literature looks within. So there is this uh, difference between the inwardness and outwardness. You know that may be the the, the visible difference that you would see uh, in in the presentations. All right, so um, you have this particular individual, Louis Elizabeth Glick. Her name is uh, the last uh, name, G L U C K, is pronounced Glick and not Gluck or Gluck. She is Glick. Fine. She was born in 1943. Um, she is an American and born in New York City. Um, she is, a, besides being a Poet, you know, she is a professor of poetry at Yale University. Um, and, you know, maybe I will start with uh, a general statement about literature in general. You know, no good poetry, no good writing is ever produced out of contentment and gratification. Right? Uh, you would not find a happy go lucky person or someone with a, you know, a devil may care attitude. Someone with a smooth life and a easy, easy li livelihood ever coming out with a great poetry or great writing. The good writing needs good grinding, good grinding, right? So, you know, so what's the case with uh, uh, Louis Glick? Her parents were not uh, but poor people, you know, her father was a businessman. Uh, you know, he, in fact, he was uh, an inventor of a particular kind of knife called exacto knife which became very popular in um domestic uh atmosphere i mean like in 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 kitchens you know these knives were used widely so he was a prosperous man he was not a bad businessman at all she had money um but as a teenager she developed some psychological issues she was uh you know anorexic suffered from a, a, a psychological a psychosomatic disease uh, called anorexia nervosa, an obsessive desire to abstain from food. You know, you, you think that your body is uh, fattening and therefore you need to abstain from, I mean, that's a psychological thing, it happens within. So, um, you know, an anorexic would feel, uh, you know, nauseous. She would hate eating food at all. And she once said, and this is very important, we'll come back to this particular point later, she once said that her disease was a manifestation of her efforts to establish a freedom from a mother's overarching influence. This is particularly important, especially in the uh, mid 20th century in America, the kind of uh, the, the, the parents in the 1950s was much uh, similar to the kind of parents that we have today in, in, our, in our place. Uh, so they had a lot of influence, uh, they had a lot of uh, control over children. So, you know, there was this tension between the daughter and the mother, right? So she she tried to somehow escape from the clutches of her mother. So, uh, you know, especially uh, living under the same roof, uh, mother, daughter, you need to uh, kill the person, you know, you need to kill the mother, matricide. We'll come to that later. I mean, of course, she, she did not kill her mother physically. So um, this uh, she this situation this um, um, condition she needed intermittent psychiatric therapies medication rehabilitation and she later wrote that she stared into the eyes of death with an intense desire to run away from it you know she was almost done for you know dead uh, but you know she somehow came back to life. And she marries uh, Charles Hertz Jr. in 1967. And in 1968, she comes out with her first collection of poems, Firstborn. That is the name of the, the collection. And it won her a lot of acclaim, critical acclaim. And, uh, you know, that is, that is probably the platform from which, you know, the spring for, uh, sp springboard from which she, you know, leaps into literature. Um, into the world of literature. Right, so what I'm planning to do is to uh, make a run through, you know, um, no point discussing a poet without, in, without discussing her poems. So uh, it's better to make a survey 
through her poems, very few samples, in, in fact, three poems of a poem, you know, just three of her poems, uh, um, so that, you know, we'll better understand the range and diversity of her um, themes. So, um, all right, uh, but the one, one, one of the three poems I have uh, chosen to discuss first um, is Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, one of the important themes of her poetry is uh, the preoccupation with the biographical or the autobiographical. Now, you know, it's very important to look at why she won Nobel Prize. I said, you know, there is a difference between, you know, a scientist winning Nobel Prize and a literature a writer winning um, Nobel Prize. You know, she won and, and most of the time, you know, the, the why is ambiguous. You know, she was awarded Nobel Prize for writing that with austere beauty makes individual existence universal. So there is a focus on the individual existence. This is the case with most of the writers. You know, literature is mainly to do with the individual, you know, looking within, you know, the inwardness. Now, you know, you have this particular poem. It's about, it's, I told you, the biographical and the autobiographical. She talks about herself. She talks about, you know, the people around her, especially uh, from uh, the domestic circle, you know. So, you know, she paints a beautiful picture. This is an imagist poem. I'll just read out the poem. Thanksgiving. In every room, encircled by a name, nameless Southern boy from Yale, there was my younger sister singing a felony theme and making phone calls while the rest of us kept moving her discarded boots or sat and drank. Outside in 29 degrees, a stray cat grazed in our driveway, seeking waste. It scratched the pail. There were no other sounds. Yet on and on the preparation of that vast consoling meal edged toward the stove. My mother had the skewers in her hands. I watched her tucking skin as though she missed her young, while bits of onion misted snow over the pronged Death. You know, I'm not going into the details of um, the elements of this particular poem, but then the preoccupation, the primary preoccupation is the individual, the the autobiographical, and the biographical. Right now, um, moving to another poem. You know, her, her poetry is about hunger. You know, as is the title of the poem. Um, her poetry is about hunger. You know, and it it could be called the poetics of desire. Now, characters range, her characters range from a mother to a god to a Greek hero to a reader. Yearn, they all yearn to fulfill their desire for such physical needs as food and sex. Uh, they also want to satisfy their yearning for attention, for abstract concepts such as honor, or metaphysical needs such as acknowledgement from a higher being. Right? So, you know, there is this desire of the individual, you know, uh, that's what she is focusing on in some of, in, in many of her poems. So in Glick's poems, desire may be defined as a libidinal current that flows, you know, I mean, we are going back to, back to um, Freud. The libidinal current that flows toward a love object, but which cannot meet its destination. You want to get it, you know, this tantalizing, there's a word called the tan tantalizing, where the word originates from uh, the Greek uh, mythological hero, uh, right, tantalizing. You 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 are about to touch something, but you cannot touch it. You As you try hard, you know, the, so, the more becomes your desire, but you cannot touch it, right? So uh, tantalizing, so that's your desire. You want to get more, but you cannot satisfy yourself, but which cannot meet its destination, for it is to continue to propel the speaker towards further personal experience. That's how it works. It, uh, it uh, She propels herself, her writing goes. So I'll, I'll read this particular poem, dedicated to hunger. It begins quietly in certain female children, the fear of death taking as its form dedication to hunger. Because a woman's body is a grave, it will accept everything, anything. I remember lying in bed at night, touching the soft, digressive breast, touching at 15, the interfering flesh that I would sacrifice until the limbs were free of blossom and subterfuge. I felt what I feel now. Aligning these words, it is the same need to perfect 
of which death is a mere byproduct. So she talks about this unending hunger, hunger that would never be satiated. Individuals about herself, uh, you know, um, right. Now she, uh, moving on to the, the next theme, a very important theme. Um, I think, you know, this could uh, uh, be a, a topic for current research and literature and, uh, and philosophy. She writes about trauma. Um, the wound in the word. So what is trauma? Trauma is characterized as the memory of an intense pain. You, know, you get different kinds of scars, the psychological scars, physical scars. They all leave a memory of a particular pain and whose intensity has somehow confused the truth of it. I, we do not know uh, how intense the pain was at some point in time later. Right? You do not know who caused the pain. Sometimes you forget it in the intensity of the pain. You uh, often remember, you often forget how it was caused and things like that. So, you know, trauma is that. You know, trauma is the effects of, of a pain, an intense pain. Um, forgets the cause of the trauma, just remembering the sense of its existence. Uh, talking about a particular Shijo, sir, I think there is some internet issues there. Whose mother uh, And uh, they had a cruel grandmother, I mean, stepmother who sent them into the deep, dark forest uh, uh, in order that they. Uh, yeah, between the two boys, I mean, two children, you know, Gretel is a girl. So Gretel um, is a younger one. Probably their mother died when in, in childbirth. So she feels the pangs of guilt, right? So, um, right. So, um, so I, I'll just read. This is the world we wanted. All who would have seen us dead are dead. I hear the witches cry, break in, break in the moonlight through a sheet of sugar. Go, God rewards. A tongue shrivels into gas. Now far from woman's Arms and memory of women in our father's hut, we sleep and never hungry. Why do I not forget? My father bars the door, bars harm from our ancestors. No one remembers, even you, my brother. Summer afternoons, you look at me as though you meant to leave, as though it never happened. Killed for you. The mother is killed, you know. The reference is to kill the mother. I see armed first. The spires of that gleam, gleaming kin. Nights I turn to you to hold me, but you are not there. Am I alone? Spies hiss in the stillness. Hansel, we are there still, and it is real, real, that black forest and the fire in the earnest. Right, so... Um, Uh, you know, she writes about trauma, which is an important theme in, um, um, uh, you know, research and literature today. Right. So uh, in, in Gretel in Darkness, you know, uh, Glick comprehends the psychological significance of the fairy tale. She talks about fairy tales. She imagines a story of matricide. And that's where that's where she. Sorry. Um, matricide is what you know she is referring to, killing one's own mother. Um, she Glick uh, Glick uh, represents Gretel as a terrified child and a traumatized adult. You know she finds herself in in, in her. Uh, Glick represents in the adult life of the speaker and especially her relationship with men, as indelibly marred by childhood memory. That involves the symbolic murder of the mother, right? So, uh, 
So that's about. I think you know that that's uh, the, yeah. I've, I've tried to you know put things in perspective in fewest words as possible. Um, I may have missed out a lot a lot of things. Um, you know, she also wrote a lot of other things. You know, she talks about her, her, the, the range of her themes um, um, from uh, spirituality, to prayer. She talks about prayer. She talks about nature, and that's a very important theme in her. You know, she draws from myths. She draws from spirituality, spiritual books, and nature, uh, uh, especially. And, uh, you know, uh, Blake is an iconoclast. What do you mean by an iconoclast? Iconoclast is someone who refuses to belong to categories, who, who says that, you know, you cannot contain me in one category. You cannot say that I am just this or that. Right? So Glick's writing most often evades ethnic identifications, religious classification, or gendered affiliation. She refuses to say that, you know, she is a feminist. Right? In fact, her poetry often negates critical assessments that affirm identity politics as criteria for literary evaluation. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think that so is the case with any great writer. You know, they do not want to be um, confined to a particular um, category. Shijo, so, Shijo, sir? Yeah, uh, Sorry. yeah, I'm done. Independent. I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Right. So uh, she says, I hardly know what feminism means uh, because, you know, she doesn't want to be, want to belong to that category as well. Of course, uh, her poems, her writings could be interpreted as... Um, you know, uh, modern literature devices, uh, modern literature um, theories uh, demand. It could be interpreted as, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, as diversely as, as, as possible. Right, so um, that's about, you know, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner in general. Um, I am sorry if I've taken more time, but, you know, this is about her. Um, I would end with a quotation from a sickness with a lump in the throat, a homesickness or a love sickness. There is a reaching out toward expression and effort to find fulfillment. And a complete poem is one where an emotion has found its thought and the thought has found the word. And you would find the best example in Glick. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we are moving to our last presentation, that is uh, a presentation on Nobel Prize of Peace awarded this year. The presentation is done by Mamda Jacob of Department of Zoology. Uh, uh, I hope uh, I'm audible and visible. Yes, Mamda, you're audible and visible. Your slides are visible here. Okay. Uh, first of all, I truly deem it as a privilege to be part of Martin Science Congress, uh, I will be discussing about the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for the year 2020. Hunger is the greatest equalizer in the world, yet it's ironic how to some it's a mere biological response of the body's nutritional needs, but to others it is the manifestation of systemic problems which has a massive implication not only on their social reality, but it also shapes their worldview, how they navigate the society and dictates their future. Hunger is not the consequence of individual pathology, but the aftermath of failing institutions, weakening of democratic ethos, lack of political will, governance deficit, structural inequality, and the ever increasing wealth disparity in the society. This relative deprivation and social injustice experienced by the people slowly conjures into political and social unrest. Hunger is political. It is a war against humanity and violation of basic human rights. It forces us to question conventional notions of what development is and revisit what it entails. When the fruits of progress are being aggressively monopolized by the elite minority of the world, the global south is pushed into starvation and hostile environments, which enables the rise of exploitative capitalism, authoritarian governments, despotic imperialism and results in inevitable humanitarian crisis. As we acknowledge the exceptional violence of wars, terrorism and genocide, we tend to forget the millions of hunger victims who die in a slower but less spectacular forms of violence. Hunger is not inevitable. It is man-made and there are victims and perpetrators. 
Conflict and hunger is a vicious circle. War and conflict can cause food insecurity and hunger, just as hunger and food insecurity can cause latent conflicts to flare up and trigger the use of violence. Wars constrain people's mobility, create black markets and restrict people's access to food, making it either unavailable or inaccessible. War-related displacement causes people to be removed from their cultivable land so they cannot grow food and it diverts the resources from people's welfare towards the war effort. War parties control what goes on and goes out of the areas under their jurisdiction and can use withholding of food as a weapon of war. Providing people with food in an emergency situation may seem like a very short-term measure. At the same time, providing for basic needs is necessary for promoting trust in society and for the focus to um, shift to education, work and rebuilding lives. This is also important for preventing the outbreak of new hostilities and armed conflicts. Without addressing the issue of food security and acute hunger, the exponential rates of malnutrition, the sustainable development goal of zero hunger adopted by the United Nations in 2015 cannot be achieved. Solving this massive crisis will help the world to weaken the impact and reduce the repercussions of conflict and war, which are oftentimes latent dysfunctions of hunger and starvation. The Nobel Peace Prize. Peace Prize for the year 2020 has been awarded to the World Food Program for its efforts to combat hunger, for its contribution to bettering conditions for peace in conflict-affected areas, and for acting as a driving force in efforts to prevent the use of hunger as a weapon of war and conflict. The World Food Program is one of the largest humanitarian organizations addressing hunger and promoting food security and it is a step forward in recognizing the seriousness of the global food crisis. It draws attention to the sustained efforts to fight hunger and famine from the grassroots to the highest level of global governance. In 2019, the World Food Programme provided assistance close to 100 million people in 88 countries who are victims of acute food insecurity and hunger. The World Food Programme is the United Nations' primary instrument for realizing this goal. In recent years, the situation although has taken a negative turn. In 2019, 135 million people suffered from acute hunger, the highest number in many years. Most of the increase was caused by war and armed conflict. The coronavirus pandemic has contributed to a strong upsurge in the number of victims of hunger across the globe. In countries such as Yemen, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, South Sudan, the combination of violent conflict and the pandemic has led to a dramatic rise um, in the number of uh, people living on the brinks of starvation. Providing assistance to increase food security not only prevents hunger, but can also help to improve prospects for stability and peace. The World Food Program has taken the lead in combining the humanitarian work with peace of efforts through pioneering projects in South America, Africa, and Asia. The World Food Program was an active participant in the diplomatic process in the UN Secretary Council, where for the first time, the link between conflict and hunger was explicitly addressed. The Security Council also underscored UN member uh, states' obligation to help ensure that food assistance reaches those in need and condemn the use of starvation as a method of warfare. The World Food Program plays a key role in multilateral cooperation on making food security an instrument of peace and has made a strong contribution towards mobilizing UN member states to compact the use of hunger as a weapon of, a weapon of war and conflict. As the United Nations' largest specialized agency, the World Food Program is a modern version of the Peace Congress uh, that the Nobel Peace Prize is intended to promote. The work of the World Food Program is to benefit the humankind, which is an endeavor that all the nations of the world should be able to endorse and support. This recognition for the World Food Program has come at a crucial time as the world is grappling with the pandemic, with, uh, which will push an additional 130 million people to the risk of acute hunger by the end of the year. 
This is nearly double the number in the newly published Global Report on Food Crisis 2020, which states that in 55 countries, the people face acute hunger as a result of the effects of climate change, conflict, and crippling economies. This scale of catastrophe is unprecedented and without timely and effective intervention and assistance of the concerned governments and organizations, the people already on the verge of starvation will succumb to this pandemic and the devastation will be unimaginable. Poor nutrition and the resulting weak immunity makes the crowded relief camps a fertile place for rampant contagion. The global south will find it extremely difficult to mobilize resources to respond to the crisis and the consequences will be too gruesome to comprehend. Another impending danger is the potential food insecurity among the urban middle class and the daily wage laborers who work in informal sectors suddenly becoming vulnerable to poverty and hunger. According to the urban slum, uh, I mean, additionally, the urban slums will be exposed to massive disease outbreaks due to unsanitary conditions, overcrowding and malnutrition. The service extended by the World Food Programme during this time is critical. The World Food Programme ensures on-the-ground presence in the most impacted and vulnerable areas to combat food insecurity, which includes real-time food security monitoring in severely impacted countries, assessing how supply chains are functioning, and monitor each household's access to healthcare. World Food Programme is also assessing where cash transfers can be distributed electronically in areas where the food is readily available and already works with the governments on an ongoing basis uh, to combat this food insecurity, to strengthen social protection systems, which are likely to feature financial assistance as a default response during the pandemic. Other measures include providing double rations, take home rations to replace school meals and launching health education campaigns. It has also set up Addis Ababa humanitarian air hub with the support of Ethiopian government to transport protective equipment, medical and food supplies, and humanitarian workers all across Africa. Ma'am, ma'am. Uh, yes. Due to time constraint, could you please short? Uh... Yes. Uh, um, I'd like to uh, conclude by saying that World Food Program or uh, the Nobel Peace Award. Uh, uh, awarded to this uh, World Food Program is a call to action to stand in solidarity to unite and organize to end world hunger. In the words of the World Food Program Executive Director David Beasley, we got a vaccine against starvation. It's called food. The hunger pandemic and the health pandemic covered together, we can solve them, but we cannot solve one in a vacuum at the isolation of the other. We have to work together. It's critical, otherwise the cure will be uh, worse than the disease. In the face of the pandemic, the World Food Program has demonstrated an exemplary ability to intensify its efforts. As the organization itself has stated, until the day we have a medical vaccine, food is the best vaccine for chaos. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. The faculty presentation has completed. I thank all the faculty who presented here for the wonderful and very informative talks. And now I request Dr. Gino Jacob of Department of Chemistry to deliver the word of thanks. Um, thank, you. You. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it was indeed a beautiful journey through supramolecular chemistry to peace. So, Professor, I, I'm not uh, stretching myself too much, uh, taking too much time for this word of thanks. So, straight away going to my duty, Professor Subi, the young energetic scientist of our country, remains a constant inspiration and model for all of us. Uh, being the recipient of two very important awards in science, like Sona Jayanti Fellowship as well as the Shanti Suru Patnagar Award. I'm sure that this meeting will remain a milestone for our students. As you are in the crucial years where uh, you are trying to find out what your interest is and position positioning yourself in a place where you work with your full potential. So I would like to thank him for his presence and his uh, main talk. Now, I would like to thank 
um, our constant support for the principal for his great interest in inculcating uh, this research aptitude in every student in science. And I thank uh, our vice principal father, George Suravikal, and uh, who is the controller of examination as well, and Dr. C.B. Matthew, uh, who is the senior most faculty in the campus, and, uh, for their felicitations and uh, for their presence. I rem and now at this juncture, I remember all former faculty who are actively involved in shaping such platforms uh, for science and research. Now I congratulate all the winners and participants of uh, Dr. VJ Dominic MSc Project Presentation Competition, all members of judging panel in the preliminary, and especially uh, Dr. Reji Vergis from Iser Trivandrum and Dr. Sinu PA from Central University of Kerala, Thanks to Dr. GB for introducing Dr. Sinu to us. And uh, I would like to place on record my gratitude to my dear colleagues who did a fabulous presentation on Nobel Prize winning topic 2020. Thank you for your efforts. We appreciate your efforts and I'm sure we could get a very concise view on all these topics. Now, I would like to make a special note of thanks to my co-coordinators, Dr. Franklin J, uh, Dean of Research, and Dr. Kim Johnson, uh, who is the IQAC coordinator. And I would like to thank Dr. C.B. Matthew and Father Thuravikal for their guidance and support uh, for this program. And I thank all deans, HODs, uh, my colleagues, and students and all the participants for their presence and support. Thank you so much. Have a great day. So with this, uh, the meeting has ended. We thank all the participants and the people who presented during this particular event. Thank you so much.